Legacy of the Dark Sage Chapter 56 Three Hours Almost half an hour had passed after the scouts of the Regis clan found the Royal Army's movement. Gathered inside the strategy meeting room in the inner wall defense headquarters were the Regis Patriarch, Heir, and Elders. A magic-projected map of the Regis estate was on the round table with bright red marked points around the inner walls. The Regis elders were all wearing a dark gray robe with gold and silver linings. From the right stood Greer, an older man with short dark gray hair, the elder in charge of the assessment team. Beside him was Abe, an older man with medium-length black hair and white streaks, who was in charge of the planning team. Next to him was Eleanor, an older woman with gray hair tied in an elaborate bun, in charge of the communications team. Across her was another older woman named Arabella, her twin sister. She had short bob black and gray hair, and she was in charge of the force deployment team. Last was Zenith, a middle-aged man with short brush-up black hair, in charge of the field operations team. The five of them stood around the table, with their dark gray eyes keenly observing the points on the map. Aaron and Cade stood on the northern end of the table and were also looking at the marks. What are your thoughts? Aaron asked no one in particular. A couple of days ago, the army was busy running around the premise of the outer wall. And now they have started to move around the inner walls. Judging from the areas where their people are going, it looks like they plan to counter our defensive array with an array of their own, Zenith was the first one to speak his mind. The others nodded in agreement. Although the marks on the map did not provide the kind of array the army was trying to make, just from looking at the areas where these markings were located, it was easy to deduce the army's intent. I believe it is an attack-focused array, Greer added. Our scouts reported that when the army were visiting the areas around the outer walls, they would stop for a few minutes and reinforce the array they had initially set up around the estate. Unfortunately, because the army has tightened their security, our scouts were unable to study the array's formation and confirm what it could do, but I am sure it is related to their movement around the inner wall. If I am to put myself in the leader's shoes. If I am planning to attack the inner walls and destroy its defenses, and yet I do not want the army's operation be known outside, then I would set up a concealment array or probably a camouflage array around the Regis estate. What are your thoughts, Lord Cade? Ib also shared his thoughts and turned to Cade. H.M. The array they prepared may not be as simple as a concealment or a camouflage array, though. It may be a combination of complex arrays. I will not be surprised if the array they prepared can also strengthen the array they plan to create outside the inner wall. I see. It may also have an amplification effect, Abe agreed with a slight nod. Yes. But, Cade paused and stared at the map where the makeshift camp of the army was located. In order to set up this kind of complex array, based on the manpower they have shown so far. It is impossible, Arabella interjected. Maintaining such an elaborate array will need a lot of mages. Also, from the communication signals we were able to decipher, the highest level of authority they currently have is a major. In terms of mage level, that equals to an adept only. Eleanor said. True, even if he combined his magic with the other two confirmed captain ranked personnel they have, it is not enough, Arabella added. However, that may not be the case if they are still expecting more people to arrive. Greer shook his head, no. They will not reveal their movements if they are still expecting reinforcements. Even now, we can already stop them from finishing their array. Exactly, Abe agreed. But why would they risk exposing their movements knowing that we can stop them? Do they think we won't make a move because we may think it is a trap to lure our forces out of the inner wall? No. This isn't a trap, Cade suddenly spoke. Everyone looked at him. Even Aaron turned his head to look at him. There was a slight smile on his face as he asked, Oh? Did you notice it? The elders turned to Aaron as well before looking back at Cade. All of them waited for him to continue. Without looking away at the makeshift camp of the army marked on the map, Cade replied, I think so. Father, will you let me handle this operation? Oh? Aaron was surprised at his sudden request. Even the rest of the elders were looking at Cade in surprise. It was not that they did not trust Cade's ability to lead. But because it had been some time since he volunteered to lead an operation. Because of an accident that almost crippled Cade's progress in magic, he had not led any operation of the Regis clan. The accident happened before he got married, and although he still managed to improve his magic, he would never become a magus. Very well. I'll leave it to you, Aaron agreed after a short pause. Cade turned to Aaron and bowed his head in respect, thank you. 
equals 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 at the Royal Army headquarters. Gail was busy reading the record Jax had submitted. This record was the one he told Jax to get from Milfiori Military School, Chiron's military school record. His eyes narrowed as he found out the color of tokens Chiron received. Humph, Gale sneered and remembered how Dean Fallon bragged about him a few years back. Gale ignored it before. He even thought Fallon was exaggerating. But not anymore. Really, such an outstanding combat student. He may even be the youngest combat specialist to start with a high rank if he entered the combat hall. Of course, this is impossible given his real situation. He closed the folder and placed it on his desk before turning his chair to look out the window. Earlier, Gale was in a bad mood because the president of the mercenary hall had not yet approved his request to update his bounty. His anger was only elevated after receiving news that Jax and his men would start their operation to break the defensive array of the Regis estate. Gale initially planned to take part in the operation. However, because his scythe broke from his encounter at the forest going to Valen Fort, he had to leave it to his trusted master artisan up north of Miliora for repair. Now, he did not have a weapon to use. Of course, Gale had a spare weapon, and it was not like he could not use his magic just because he didn't have one. However, after going through Chiron's record, his interest had taken a full 180 turn. He could be in Starhorn right now, he thought. Since the mercenary hall has not approved yet, maybe I should make a move myself. A smile crept at the corner of his lips as he leaned back on his chair and stared at the blue sky. Equals 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 equals. When Stella returned to her office, she immediately noticed the books she brought to Chiron were already on the other side of the table. The seven worn out books she placed on the table were currently open, and Chiron looked at not one but all of it simultaneously. He would stop now and then and would write something on a parchment placed all over the map he had placed in the middle of the table. Stella noticed that there were notes and markings everywhere on the previously clean map. Don't tell me. She cautiously walked to Chiron's side and placed the breakfast she prepared at an unoccupied space on the table. Since she anticipated time would be different once she returned, she prepared a hearty meal for him. Chiron, why don't you rest and eat first? Stella asked and sat on the cushion just beside Chiron. However, Chiron did not seem to hear her and just continued to read. I knew it, Stella could not help but sigh. She remembered a report she received from Malek when Chiron was still at military school. The Milfiori military school had a joint activity with another military school. During one lesson, Chiron found out that the techniques studied in the other school were different. He became curious, and immediately after, he borrowed the books of one of the visiting students. Instead of joining the social gathering the schools had prepared during their day off, he locked himself in his room and just read all day. He did not even come out for a meal. I should have told him to eat first before coming here, Stella thought. She looked at Chiron's notes on the map and read them. After a while, black lines appeared on her head. She could not read them. W what are these? Coded notes? Wasn't Chiron acting too cautious? Why did he have to write his notes in codes? Did he think she would read them? Well, she did try to read them just now, but it was only because she wanted to know his progress. After a few minutes, Chiron took a deep breath and leaned back. He made one last look at the map and the notes he wrote. Then he placed his left hand above them. Purple rings appeared on his palm. H. Hey! Stella was startled. The purple rings connected and formed a disc large enough to fill the map and the notes. Chiron, what are you dash? Before she could finish what she was saying, the rings fell on top of the map and all the notes. And in just a few seconds, all of it disintegrated. Why would you do that? Stella exclaimed and looked at Chiron incredulously. Chiron, who seemed to notice her presence finally, only tilted his head a little to the side and asked, Do what? Destroy your notes? You even used coded letters so why bother destroying it? I can't leave evidence, Chiron replied with a shrug and reached for the seven worn-out books. Can't leave evidence. Stella repeated in a daze. Here, Chiron placed the books in front of her. Thanks. With a slight shake of her head, Stella looked at the books and asked, You've read all of it? Yes. I understand the gist of the relationship of each faction in the Empire and outside. Now I need a plan, Chiron replied and also took the books on the other side of the table. Wait. 
you're not going to tell me you've read those as well? Stella was starting to doubt if she really input the correct time ratio inside her study. I've read some of the books before, so I skipped them. Do you mind if I look around and find more books about magic? Chiron replied curtly and changed the subject right after. No, Stella replied, then shook her head. I mean, yes. Stop for a moment. Do you realize you've been reading nonstop? I've been away for what more than an hour outside which makes it less than two days here. You need to eat or you'll fall sick. Of course, I know that. I did eat. You did? Chiron pointed at his pouch and said, as you said. I've come prepared. Stella's brow twitched. Right. Do you mind? Eat first, she said and slid the plate in front of him. Chiron looked at the plate and frowned slightly. The food Stella brought him was full of protein. Steak, sausage, egg. There was also a big loaf of bread, hot soup, assorted sliced fruits, and a milk bottle. I can't eat all of Dash. Please, let me see you eat or else I'd think you're no longer normal. Chiron frowned, that's rude. I know. But if you keep on doing all these. Stella gestured at the books and even at Chiron and continued, impossible stunts you can't blame me for thinking this way. Chiron bit back his argument because he thought it would be pointless. He was actually glad that he managed to read all those books and even memorize what he had to in less than two days. Of course, if Stella knew what he was thinking, she would probably make a big deal out of it. With a sigh of resignation, Chiron picked up the fork and started to eat. Stella leaned back with a smile and watched him eat. After a few seconds, she asked. So do you understand now the different factions in the Empire? Chiron nodded as he sliced the steak. I do. And I realized how complicated their relationships are. The Emperor holds the highest power, being part of the royal family that originally fought and established the Empire. However, while on the surface, the royal army acted according to the Emperor's will, in reality, the three noble families had a better hold of the army. Then the West faction had a complicated relationship with the deputy marshal assigned there, Deputy Marshal Emin. First, since the Templar Code had its own independent faction, and their base was near the deputy marshal's office, they tend to clash, especially when it comes to their interests. Second, during the Forest Beast's invasion, the deputy marshal would always call for their assistance, and if they appeared, they would always be the ones to lead. Thus, when danger happens, their members tend to suffer first before them. Third, they needed to share their resources directly with the deputy marshal. The North and East factions had a better relationship with the deputy marshals assigned there. In the North, Deputy Marshal Ingrid rarely ordered the Oriole to help during the Beast's invasion. She also rarely meddled in the Oriole's affairs. Same with the East faction. Deputy Marshal Manic was too busy finding ruins to conquer. Apart from that, the East faction was the Conclave, and they had been neutral and independent all these years. Then there were those smaller factions and Chiron already had his eyes set on one of them. For now, he planned to visit the leader of that faction. Anything you want to know, just ask. I'll answer as much as I can, Stella's voice broke Chiron's thoughts. I'm good for now. I guess your target now has read as much as you can about magic. I'll go find more books for you. Stella volunteered and stood up. Thanks, Chiron said and watched her go down the stairs. Once she was out of sight, he immediately placed the fork he was holding on the side of the plate and sighed. He looked at the big map of the empire mounted on the wall and looked at the spot south of the empire. While reading the books on history and geography, Chiron came across a place south of the Ilfen Empire. Chaos Palace. The books mentioned an unconquered ruin by the Dark Sage, and he wanted to visit that place. After reading the records of war, Chiron had realized a lot of the things he was lacking. While he was confident with his hand-to-hand -hand combat and weapon knowledge, he did not have a weapon that would complement his magic. And that might become a problem in the future. Chiron wondered if he could find something in Chaos Palace. He was also curious what kind of weapon the Dark Sage had used and if it was inside his palace. However, his priority was to secure his clan's safety first. He was aware that his clan would never be out of danger as long as they were an Ilfen Empire. Unfortunately, he knew his family would never agree to leave their ancestral land. He could not evacuate each of their clan members as well. But it wouldn't matter once he sorted out his plans. He'd be able to secure their safety, and no one, not even the army, the royal family, and the three noble families could touch them. 
equals 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 Jax left his tent as soon as he heard carriages arriving. REBVEL.C. Six carriages stopped just outside the makeshift camp. Some officers went to the last carriage and helped in unloading supplies. The door of the front carriage opened, and a woman with flaming reddish brown hair and green uniform got out. The woman was Vera. She immediately saluted upon seeing Jax and said, Major Jax. Awaiting your orders. Jax nodded and gestured for her to stand at ease. Vera obediently followed. The preparations are completed. Now I need you and Luca to go in position. Here, Jax handed her an orb. Use your magic sense to read the contents of what you need to do in that orb. Vera held the orb and nodded, yes, Major Jax. Then let's go. The two, together with six officers each, made their way out of the camp. Note please do consider supporting me on Buy Me A Coffee website and do like, share, and subscribe. Chapter 57 The Spirit Savior Silas stood in front of a hallway leading back to the hidden door where he met Phoebe. It had been a quarter of an hour since Lady Rin dropped him off. He did not leave immediately and told her he wanted to make preparations first. When she asked if he needed anything, he kindly refused. Lady Wren might have felt he wanted to be alone because she did not insist and bid him farewell with a faint smile. Her intuition was correct. Because the secret of the spirit Silas learned from her did leave him in shock. Lady Wren already warned him that the secret she would tell him might answer some of his doubts about what happened to his family. It never occurred to him that the conspiracy that led to his family's downfall was just the tip of a bigger one that involved the hero families mentioned in history. During the Chaos Reign era, the Dark Sage ruled the whole land and instilled fear in every creature's heart, not only because of his almost godlike void magic but also because of his army. The Legion of Demons These demons invaded the whole land from another plane even before the Dark Sage had risen in power. During that age, three hero families appeared and fought back. After years of bloodshed, the hero families finally suppressed the demons and banished them to the outer southern land, and peace slowly returned to the mainland. Because of the contribution of the hero families, the people of the land had turned to them and even revered them as the new lords. There were still skirmishes at the borders of the southern land as demons tried to invade again, but the hero families drove them back every time. However, after two years, the dark sage appeared and ventured to the land of the demons. There he single-handedly enslaved all of them and once again brought chaos to the whole land. The dark sage ruled for almost thirty years before finally, the hero families made a last stand. As a result, one of the leading heroes sacrificed herself to let another hero mortally wound the Dark Sage and successfully seal him. The hero who made a sacrifice was an ancestor of the royal family. And thus, her family became the land leader and eventually built the Ilfin Empire after hundreds of years. Of course, this was a known fact by all because it was written in history books. However, Lady Wren had told Silas a fact that was never revealed to the world. The hero who wounded and sealed the Dark Sage was actually the ancestor of the Regis family. As to why it was never revealed, it was all because of a conspiracy that the hero families had kept hidden. Whether the Regis ancestor was also involved was unknown even to his predecessors. After hundreds of years, this conspiracy was kept hidden. Until the face spirits learned of it. Since the spirits lived in another plane and could enter the human plane as they please without being seen, they learned about the conspiracy of the royal family and they were not happy. Then the incident happened. A member of the royal army who was also a spirit mage went to the royal palace to receive a commendation. During the ceremony, her spirit suddenly appeared and angrily attacked the queen and the royal princess. The spirit mage was detained, and her spirit was locked up. Up to this day, the fate of the mage and her spirit was unknown. After the incident, the royal army investigated all known spirit mages and their families. When one family could not answer the army's interrogation, they were immediately branded as traitors who were building an army of spirits to overthrow the royal family as well as practicing forbidden magic. The army executed the family representatives on the spot. And their territory was raided and razed to the ground overnight. This was the Svel family of the north, Silas's family. Silas gritted his teeth as he reigned in his anger. Just because his family could not answer, the army wiped out his whole family? Unreasonable, he thought in anger. Your family probably refused to tell why a spirit would attack the royal family. They were brave and loyal spirit masters. 
I know some would think it foolish to choose to save the spirits over their own lives. But because of what your family did, we had a chance to expose the truth. Lady Rin's words flashed through Silas's mind. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath. After a short pause, he opened his eyes and took out a round magic item. He urged his magic inside the magic item, and soon it glowed in light blue. Finally, he entered the dark hallway. While walking, Silas remembered the rest of his conversation with Lady Wren. Just what truth would the royal family be afraid of being exposed, he had asked. The truth, that the one the royal army branded as the most villainous mage in history, the Dark Sage, was revered by the spirits as their savior. It was only then that Silas realized how Lumi called the Dark Sage as Void Master. As if calling him the Dark Sage was taboo to her. Even Lady Wren. Of course, she might have refrained from referring to him as such because her own son had the same magic. And even if the Void Master was the spirit's savior, why would the spirits want to meet the new one? It's not like he is the reincarnation of the previous Void Master, right? Silas wondered. He also realized that the battle that led to the Dark Sage's downfall might have a deeper story behind it. The fact that the spirits revered him as a savior was a hint. It was also why the royal family did not want this truth to be exposed. If the truth that not all creatures were afraid of the Dark Sage, then those fanatics who believed he was a god would do everything to find out the truth of what happened years ago and expose the royal family. But what about the Regis' ancestor? Why did he not expose the truth? He remembered how almost 200 years ago, the Regis' patriarch of that time suddenly decided to close the door of the Regis' clan's estate. Did he discover the truth? Silas also felt it was ironic how the Regis' ancestor killed the Dark Sage, yet one of his descendants was born with void magic. Did the Void Master curse him before he died? Like I will have my revenge. And it will be through your descendant, kind of curse? Silas wondered. He shook his head and sighed. It felt as if his brain cells had been exhausted just trying to digest all this information. Let's focus on getting out first. Lady Wren also said the army had tightened security outside and that they are up to something, Silas told himself. He felt a little disheartened that Lady Wren rejected the notion when he offered to stay and help. She only told him to focus on getting out of the estate safely. Clearly, she did not want to drag him into the Regis business. She's right, though. I have my own business to deal with, he thought. After a few minutes, he finally reached the hidden door. He put the magic item back into his storage space and slowly opened the door. Once again, he felt that invisible veil wrapped his body as he passed through the door. He closed the door immediately after getting out and expanded his magic sense. Contrary to his expectation, it seemed there were no army officers nearby. Not that he was complaining. As soon as he was sure the coast was clear, he made a sprint toward the woods. It didn't take long when suddenly the ground quaked and an explosion occurred above the Regis' inner wall. What? Silas stopped in his tracks and turned toward the direction of the inner wall. From where he stood, he saw a violet tint veil spread around the inner walls from above. The Regis's defensive array activated, and a light golden barrier appeared, forming a half sphere around the Regis inner wall. No! The array! Silas exclaimed as he saw cracks appearing on the surface of the Regis's defensive array where the violet veil made contact. His body impulsively made a move back toward the walls but before he could progress further, a ball of snowflakes formed in front of him, and with a small puff, Lumi appeared. Stupid little Silas. Where do you think you're going? She reprimanded. Lady Lumi, Silas exclaimed in surprise. Then his expression turned solemn, and he said, I need to go back, the Regis are dash dot. Stupid. 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 Lumi berated and threw several snowballs at his face. Let's say you went back. What can you do? I already told you not to get tangled with the Regis's affairs any further. But dash. No buts. The Regis's has their own system. Just because they are under attack doesn't mean they're already in danger. Besides do you think you can enter their walls after getting out? The Regis's defensive array will not fall easily just because it looks as if that veil was effective. Just as Lumi said this, a deafening crack resounded all over the Regis's defensive array as soon as the veil reached the middle portion of the half-sphere. A vein appeared on Lumi's forehead as she turned and glared at the barrier that looked like it would be destroyed any second. She formed her small fists into a tight ball and raised it angrily towards the Regis' inner wall. Don't make me look like an idiot. She berated at no one in particular. 
black lines appeared on Silas's head. He was about to say something when he sensed army officers running toward his location. Lumi also felt them and her eyes narrowed. She turned to Silas and said, Go now. Remember your own mission and focus. Tisk. Silas gritted his teeth. He tightened his grip on his fists and finally turned back to the woods. He left before the army officers could see him, with Lumi flying right behind him. Equals 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 equals. Cade stood outside the inner wall defense headquarters, watching as the Regis's defensive array above started to crumble. Behind him, two squads of ten Regis combat mages stood awaiting his orders. All of them were wearing black leather armor and half face masks. They were also equipped with metal gauntlets where several small spirit stones of different colors were attached around the wrists. Lowering his gaze, Cade closed his eyes, and a three meter radius silver array appeared under his feet. The moment his array appeared, the crumbling array stabilized, and the violet veil's progress slowed. Raya, head southwest, around eight o'clock from this position. He said without looking behind him. The man in front of the squad to his bowed, yes. Lord Cade. REBVEL.C. Green arrays circled Raya and his squad's lower legs before they moved toward the direction Cade told them. Mist, head north, three o'clock. Right away, Lord Cade. Mist replied. Similarly, green arrays circled him and his squad's lower legs before they left toward the north part of the inner walls. As soon as they were out of sight, Cade opened his eyes, which glowed in silver light. From where he stood, he could see the sixty meter tall gates of the Regis inner walls. He lifted his hand and aimed at the gates. In an instant, several huge octagonal-shaped silver arrays appeared starting from the gates then all around the walls. When these silver arrays filled every wall of the Regis' inner walls, Cade finally lowered his arm. He then took out a scroll from his space storage ring and burned it using his magic. The silver array under his feet disappeared and was replaced by a light golden array. It lit up, and Cade disappeared soon after. Chapter 58 Heaven's Rupture Half an hour earlier. Vera was inside the carriage, heading to one of the critical locations of the array the army had set up. The orb she read indicated that Mika and the rest of her team were already there. The truth, her team was not aware that she would be joining the operation today because her injuries had not fully recovered. However, she could not stay idle, knowing that her team was out here. While reading through the contents of the mission, she realized that the array they had prepared was very complex, and the whole operation was not what she had expected. She thought her role was to amplify the magic array, the same way she and Dior did with the four-colored ruin array during their operation to capture Chiron. Vera's brows knitted at the thought of him. Her blood started to boil, and her heart beat rapidly. She had never hated anyone like this before. She would never forgive him for attacking her members mercilessly and leave them to die. An idea popped into her mind as she looked into the orb jacks gave her and rechecked the mission. Her expression turned solemn, and her eyes glinted malevolently. Initially, she planned to return to camp and rest once she completed her part. But now that Jax had presented an opportunity for her to attack the Regis, she now decided to join the infiltration team. An eye for an eye, Vera thought. Since there was no chance to vent her anger at him directly, then she would have to settle with taking down a minimum of three Regis members in today's operation. When she and Chiron met again, she would gloat before him for running away and leaving his clan to die. Her lips formed into a sinister smile. We're here, Captain Vera. An officer who was at the helm of the carriage announced after a few minutes. Good, she nodded. The carriage stopped at the location where an earlier squad of six army officers had set up one of the key corners of the array formation. Suppressing the murderous intent brewing inside her, Vera finally stepped out of the carriage. Once outside, she surveyed her surroundings. A good thirty meters away from the Regis' inner wall, an elaborate seven-meter-wide triangular-shaped array with rods struck on its corners was drawn by the army on the ground. Two circular arrays were drawn overlapping the triangular array with runes written at the borders. The six army officers were seated inside the circular array forming a round position. One of the officers inside was Mika. At the moment, all officers inside were meditating as they supply magic energy inside the array. Vera knew that there were five similar arrays located in different points all around the Regis' inner wall. The array they created was called Heaven's Rupture. Its effect was to break a defensive array that was two tier above it. 
Of course, this could only be possible if the array points around that defensive array were enough. Normally, six points were not enough to occupy the whole Regis defensive array. However, with Vera's magic, she could distort the space between each point to make the array work. Doing this would put a great strain on her mind, and Jax was aware of it. Thus, Luca's speciality would come into play. Luca was a support type mage. His innate magic was called enhancement magic. But his magic's limitation was he could only use it on magic items. And these rods were prepared by him to enhance the effect of the array. Creating all 18 rods was not easy, and it took him almost two days to complete all of them. It would also lessen the strain Vera needed to connect each point. But this was not the only crucial part of their operation. Vera sneered as she thought of Jax. To think that Major Jax could come up with such a plan. No wonder the Grand Marshal entrusted him with this mission, she thought. Yes. The most crucial point of this operation was not the array they prepared to destroy the Regis defensive array. It was the infiltration part where Jax would lead. Get everyone ready. After I activated the array, we will rendezvous with Major Jax. Vera announced. Yes, Captain. The officers replied. Equals 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 equals. At another point of Heaven's Rupture Array, Luca and his team were waiting for the signal to start the operation officially. It did not take long when they saw the rods lit up, and the two circular arrays that overlapped the triangular one started to rotate. The runes around its borders hovered above and circled the rods. Magic fluctuations filled the air. A huge triangular light violet array appeared after a couple more minutes, high above the sky within the Regis inner wall. After a few seconds, another triangular array appeared just above the first array but in red color. It combined with the first array and formed a six-sided star. A bolt of red-violet lightning struck the rods on the array coming from one point of the six-sided star above. Boom! An explosion occurred, and a violet veil emerged from the six-sided star and spread above the Regis inner wall. The Regis's defensive array activated soon after and formed a light golden half-sphere barrier protecting the inner wall. Luca sneered. Now, it starts. He thought. Let's go. He told his team and signaled for them to leave. Same with Vera, their next stop was to rendezvous with Major Jax and the rest. Equals 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 equals. Jax looked up as soon as the six-sided star appeared above the Regis inner wall. He was at the rendezvous point with the rest of the army. Already, he noticed the tension and excitement of the officers with him when the Regis's defensive array showed signs of crumbling. However, he was not thrilled because he had some reservations about destroying the Regis's defensive array. When the officers researching the Regis's defensive array had proposed using the Heaven's Rupture array to counter it, he expected the Grand Marshal to disapprove because such an array needed many resources. But Jack still prepared a proposal and went back to headquarters to report to Gale personally. However, it was unfortunate that Gale was not in the mood and approved his proposal without reading the details. Jax did not understand why Gale's mood took a sudden turn when he was very lenient the night before. Still, he had to explain all the materials and manpower they would need to proceed with the plan. Gale still approved everything. However, when Jax requested at least one master mage be included in the operation, Gale did not say anything and only handed him three summoning tokens. Jax knew what the tokens were and it was the very reason why he had mixed emotions in today's operation. Once they used these tokens, there would only be a massacre. His conscience kept nagging him. So he decided not to conceal the army's movement to give the Regis's time to prepare. Hopefully, the Regis Patriarch would be wise enough and not retaliate too much. If not, they would really have to use the summoning tokens. Get ready! Jax announced as soon as the Violet Veil started to cover the activated Regis's barrier. Yes, Major. All officers saluted at once. A quarter of an hour later, Vera and Luca's team arrived. Both teams had consumed several teleportation tokens to arrive at the rendezvous point as soon as possible. Then they all proceeded to another makeshift camp the army built. All of them entered a huge tent. Once inside, Luca and Vera could not help but exchange glances as soon as they saw three transportation arrays on the ground. You both know where this array leads, Jack started and looked at Luca and Vera. The two saluted, yes. 
the Regises will be occupied in dealing with the Heaven's Rupture Array and will not realize that this here is our real intention. Every large area defensive array had a flaw. And that was it could only cover the outer premise it could reach. Of course, there were countermeasures to cover even hidden areas, but they already confirmed that the Regis did not have any of them. After Gale approved the operation, Jax returned to the camp and ordered several selected officers to dig below the Regis's inner wall in secret. If ordinary humans did it, it would take them weeks to complete. However, the officers Jax selected were all Earth mages, and digging had been easy. Still, it took them a couple of days to dig three areas because the Regis's inner wall's foundation was deep, and its walls were thick. They were only able to create three holes with a diameter of three meters. Still, they did not dig further in because they might alarm the Regis's scouts if they did. There was still a good fifteen meters before they could reach the above ground going inside their land. After this, Jax planted the transportation arrays near the end of the path of the areas they had dug. These transportation arrays were an army-exclusive artificial array. And those transportation arrays were connected to these transportation arrays before them. Jax took out two of the summoning tokens and handed each to Luca and Vera. Used it only when needed, he told them. If you encounter a problem, contact me at once. The two took the tokens and nodded, yes, Major Jax. Jax nodded and finally said, move out. Luca and Vera's teams each entered a transportation array. These transportation arrays would automatically activate once the number of people inside met the required quantity. It could transport 12 people at once. Luca and Vera each had a total of 24 members, including them. They would have to use the transportation array twice. Jax waited until both of their teams had been transported before his team also moved to the last array. However, REBVEL.C. Light gold arrays appeared on the ground and paralleled above it. Magic fluctuations filled the air as the space inside the array twisted. The remaining officers, as well as Jax, stopped short in shock. All of them gaped at the array that appeared before them. What in the dash? Jax exclaimed as a silhouette formed within the space. His eyes widened as soon as he recognized who it was. This Heaven's Rupture array is a very bold move. To think you have a space mage with you, really unexpected. A tall, handsome man with shoulder-length black hair and dark gray eyes clad in black armor appeared before them. The light golden array disappeared, and the man looked at Jax. Heaven's Rupture Array is a Tier 5 counteroffensive array that could destroy a defensive array two levels above it, the man was saying. His eyes slowly glowed silver, and with a slight smile, he said, I'm a little offended. Jax gritted his teeth and growled, Cade Regis. Chapter 59 Summoning Token all the officers in Jax's team moved. The tent was suddenly filled with different color arrays as they roused their magic. A few of them took out their staffs, while the others took out swords, spears, or crossbows. All of them aimed their weapons at Cade. Jax, on the other hand, did not move and only glared at Cade. Similarly, Cade was not bothered by all the weapons aimed at him. His eyes were fixed only at Jax. As the next Regis Patriarch, he obviously knew who Jax was. He was also aware of what type of magic he had and his level. And to be honest, Cade would just be bullying them if he made a move. He did not want to do that. He requested to handle the situation because he sensed Jax had purposely let them know the army's movement. If this was true, then there was room for negotiation. The other elders would be able to handle it, however, in their current situation, if they wanted to negotiate, the talk must be between two representatives with authority to decide. What gave it away? Jax finally asked. Hmm. Cade raised his brows at Jax's questions. His question and attitude were a little puzzling. Did Jax really believe Cade would not be able to recognize the array they planned to counter their defensive array? Cade was the creator of the Regis Inner Wall defensive array. To strengthen the array, he researched many counteroffensive arrays that might be used against it. Aside from this, he created it with Chiron's safety in mind. His goal was to create a defensive array that even Omegas could not destroy. This way, even if Chiron's magic were exposed, they would be able to protect him within the Regis's inner walls. Unfortunately, before Cade could complete the defensive array, the royal army raided their estate. Major Jax, right? Cade started without answering Jax's question. Let's be sensible. I don't want to hurt your young officers. He looked at each of Jax's team members. I also don't hold a grudge from the time your men raided our estate, he continued. 
I understand that you are just taking orders. So I would ask you and your men to leave now and let us be. Jack sneered, you sounded as if we attack your estate indiscriminately. Lord Cade, we both know why we came that night. Cade nodded, true. The royal family was very adamant in apprehending anyone who practices forbidden magic. They don't tolerate forbidden magic users. But let me ask you Major Jax. Do you have evidence that my son used his magic before your men raided us that night? Did it not occur to you that while it seems like we are protecting him, hiding him even, we actually just want to keep his magic under control? Jax did not reply. Even the officers with him looked at each other uneasily. The army found about Chiron because his magic signature leaked, and they detected it. However, his magic signature remained inside the Regis estate. It never left. They were also aware that the Regis had sealed it since he was a child. And his magic signature was too weak compared to when they fought him in the forest. Sensing the officers, being swayed by Cade's words, Jax's face turned sour. Don't make it sound like your clan was doing the Empire a favor, he said. If you have reported him the moment he manifested his magic this would not happen. Cade smiled, but his smile was no longer friendly. Magic fluctuations started to rise around him. If Jack showed even a sliver of hesitation after he said his piece, he would have started the negotiation. But it would seem, Jax was just another royal army compatriot. Men like him would be hard to talk to. Then let's not waste time, he thought as his silver eyes glinted malevolently. What you just said sounded to me like it was wrong not turning my six-year-old son to the army so they can deal with him. And what would the army do? Experiment on him? Execute him in public? Or? His magic pressure burst, and the magic arrays of every officer inside started to fluctuate. Jax was the only one who was still able to withstand Cade's pressure. However, he suddenly had a bad feeling about what Cade's next words would be, and if the officers with him hear it, the Grand Marshal would surely order to eliminate all of them. Give him to the royal family and let the men's dash. Not good. Jax did not think twice and immediately used the summoning token. A powerful whirlwind burst out from Jax and immediately ransacked the whole tent. Ah! Some of the officers were blown away by the fierce wind. Jax was able to withstand the wind because he was the one who used the token, so he had a certain immunity to it. Cade's eyes narrowed as the whirlwind assaulted him in all directions. However, with him being a master abjurer, the wind's attack would not be enough to put a scratch on him. Suddenly, Rorf. A deafening roar echoed within the whirlwind. Cade's brow creased as he sensed a new presence appearing within the whirlwind. Don't tell me. His eyes widened as he realized what Jax did. A summoning token. Within the whirlwind, two enormous flaming fists appeared and aimed at Cade's head. Cade immediately jumped back to evade. He roused his magic while still in midair, and two silver arrays circled his lower arms. Pieces of dark obsidian rocks appeared within the array, forming huge gauntlets. It covered both his arms just in time as the enormous fists that missed him hit the ground where he was just at. The whole ground caved in, and smashed earth circulated within the whirlwind. Kate immediately used his arms to cover his upper body as the whirlwind, now with pieces of earth, assaulted him. Rorf! The voice inside the whirlwind roared in annoyance and finally stepped out of the whirlwind to grab Kate. It was a huge five-meter-tall flaming red-skinned minotaur. As soon as Cade touched the ground, he instantaneously rolled to his left to avoid the minotaur's flaming hand. The minotaur missed again, but his reflex was fast even with its size, and he used his other hand to catch Cade. Cade ducked to avoid the minotaur once again while also striking the ground with his right. Silver Ray appeared on the ground where his fist landed, and sharp obsidian rocks shot up from the ground toward the minotaur. Rorf! The minotaur roared, and the whirlwind's range got smaller and circled him. The flames on his body ignited and formed into flaming armor. When Cade's attack arrived, the minotaur swiped his huge arms and instantly crushed them. Strong, Cade thought with narrowed eyes. His magic had higher immunity with fire-type magic and physical attacks. Yet the minotaur was able to crush it like it was regular stones. A smile slowly formed at the corner of Cade's lips. It had been some time since he last fought someone who could easily crush his magic. A few meters away from them, Jax turned to the rest of the officers and yelled, Retreat at once. This was why he did not want to use the summoning token. The summoned creature would only regard the one who summoned it as its ally and would destroy everything and everyone else. This token was a product of the Royal Army's research division. 
however, the idea was not initially theirs. One exploration team of the royal army that entered the Chaos Palace was able to find a summoning token. It was unknown if the Dark Sage created it or a product of the demons he commanded. Recently, the Royal Army's research division finally succeeded in replicating the token's ability. They also found out how to seal powerful monsters they could capture from the ruins into the tokens. And this Minotaur was one of the rare monsters the army captured. All officers immediately retreated. They did not even look back as they heard the Minotaur roared again. Rorf! The Minotaur dashed toward Cade, leaving a flaming trail behind him. This time, Cade had no intention of evading. Although the Minotaur was more than twice his size, it was not the first time he had dealt with huge monsters. Silver rays appeared around his body as his black armor formed an additional layer of thick obsidian material. Another huge silver ray appeared in front of him and a thick gigantic obsidian shield formed. The Minotaur crashed onto the shield, and Cade was pushed back in the process. The ground under him cracked, and the Minotaur almost crushed him into it. NGH. Cade gritted his teeth. He felt every bone on his lower body creaked in protest from the weight of the Minotaur. He immediately roused the Regis body tempering technique to alleviate the strain. However, the Minotaur's attack was not over. He moved his huge flaming fists and bombarded the shield with punches. Each punch from the Minotaur sent a shockwave that penetrated Cade's defenses. He could also feel the heat from the Minotaur's flames, and his shield showed signs of melting. Rorf! This time, it was Cade's turn to roar. His muscles bulged as he activated the Regis's body tempering technique's second phase. Cade lifted the shield and used it to counter the incoming punches of the Minotaur. Rorf! The Minotaur roared in anger when Cade successfully countered his punches and even forced both his arms upward, leaving his front wide open. Cade took this chance and slammed the shield on the Minotaur's abdomen. The Minotaur was forced to step back. However, his flaming armor ignited and blasted toward Cade. Tisk, Cade knew his shield would not hold any longer, judging from the heat of the Minotaur's flames. So he immediately jumped back. However, the Minotaur's right arm moved and hurled toward Cade's left side as soon as he jumped. Erg! Cade was thrown a good few meters to his right and crashed into a few trees. The Minotaur's physical strength was really monstrous that if he did not activate the second phase of the Regis's body tempering technique earlier, that one single attack from the Minotaur would have broken his ribcage. Jax's eyes widened after witnessing the exchange between Cade and the Minotaur. He was actually prepared to assist the Minotaur, but now he realized it was unnecessary. If he did, he might even hinder the Minotaur's movement. When Cade was thrown to the side, the Minotaur chased after him. As soon as Cade hit the last tree, the Minotaur jumped. His hands were clamped together as he aimed at Cade's head. Cade's silver eyes glinted as three silver rays appeared above him. Three more obsidian shields formed. REBVEL.C. The Minotaur's fists slammed on these shields and crashed them easily. But this delay was enough to let Cade successfully roll to the side and evade. In this kind of situation, most mages would have already felt despair and would plan an escape. However, to Cade, the more he was cornered, the more he wanted to break his opponent. He was suddenly reminded of his good friend, who would always comment how he had a terrifying temper. The Minotaur turned and glared at Cade. He did not immediately follow up an attack after failing. He snorted, clearly in annoyance, as flames shot out of his nostrils. Cade returned the glare as he stood up. When he went here, he did not expect to start a fight. Now that it had come to this, then he better take this seriously. He took a deep breath and smiled at the Minotaur. Then he said, why don't we take things up a notch? Boom! Without waiting for a reaction from the Minotaur, Cade's magic pressure suddenly erupted. Silver runes appeared all over his body. And his silver eyes glinted. Slowly, Cade's pupils turned into slits. Chapter 60 The Regis Blessing Jax's eyes widened as soon as he felt Cade's magic pressure increasing. Since the royal army kept records on all promising master mages, Cade's information was not a secret within the royal army with ranks major and above. Before Cade got married, he got into an accident that almost crippled his magic progress. Their record noted that he would never be able to reach the Magus level because of the accident. But based on the pressure he was exerting right now, Jax felt that it was already close to a Magus. Few abjurers could attain the level of a Magus, and those who did made names for themselves. One of the best examples of a Magus abjurer was the infamous Azaloth. 
Such talent, a pity he will never be a magus, Jax thought with a slight shake of his head. No. If Kate did become a magus, it would have been harder for the army to take down the Regis's inner wall. This was actually a good thing for them. We actually just want to keep his magic under control. Kate's words flashed through Jax's mind. Ever since Kate said those words, he tried to ignore the feeling that what they were doing was wrong from the start. Jax had a family of his own. His oldest son just turned five, and by next year, he might even manifest his innate magic. If his son's innate magic was also a forbidden type, would he be able to report it to the army? Stop. Don't think about things that has not happened. It will only dull your thoughts, Jack scolded himself and pushed all unnecessary thoughts at the back of his mind. He was an officer of the Royal Army, all forbidden magic users should be apprehended. No exceptions. Boom. Jack snapped out of his reverie and turned his attention back on Kate and the Minotaur. His scalp almost went numb at what greeted him. The Minotaur was thrown back a few meters away, with Kate already in pursuit. What just happened? Jax exclaimed. After Cade released the seal on his blood, it awakened the dormant magic within him. This immediately boosted not just his magic pressure but also his physical abilities. That was why the Minotaur failed to react in time when he moved and landed a punch on his abdomen. Before the Minotaur could regain his balance, Cade had already reached him. Cade linked his hands and jumped. Silver arrays circled on his gauntlets as they doubled in size, and he instantaneously struck the Minotaur's head. The Minotaur spat out a mouthful of dark red blood as he stumbled forward. Kate's attack continued. While still in midair, silver rays formed around his huge gauntlets. Its shape changed and turned into a huge obsidian hammer. He raised it high up his head before ramming it on the Minotaur's body. Rorf! The Minotaur growled in pain as he slammed on the ground. The ground exploded, and earth dust spread around them. Kate released the shape of his magic as and it returned to normal gauntlets. But. Rorf. The Minotaur's flaming hand appeared from the dust below and grabbed Kate's waist. NGH. Kate gritted his teeth as the Minotaur was able to grab him and slammed him on the ground. Another explosion occurred, and the earth dust that filled the air thickened. Rorf. The Minotaur roared in glee. His armor burst out and was about to blast the area where he slammed Cade with scorching hot flames when a silver array appeared within the dust. Won't you shut up? A huge obsidian spear shot out from the array and went straight at the Minotaur's chest. The Minotaur did not evade and instead let his flaming armor burst out to defend against the spear. Whoosh! The spear ignored the flaming armor's heat and pierced the Minotaur's chest. Rorf! He growled in pain. But it did not deter the Minotaur, and instead, its flames became fierce as he bombarded with flaming punches the area where Cade should be. Dust and flames engulfed them as the Minotaur attacked in rage. Suddenly, several small silver rays appeared and surrounded the Minotaur at different angles. Black obsidian spears shot out on each of these rays and pierced the Minotaur's body. The spears that attacked from above extended further, and its spearhead pierced the ground, pinning the Minotaur in place. The Minotaur roared in pain. Jax, who was watching from afar, was gaping in horror. Although the dust and flames that covered the area where the two were fighting had thickened, Jax still managed to see what's happening using his magic sense and what he just witnessed was nothing like he had ever seen before. Minotaurs far exceed the level of a human's physical prowess. And since they were born with magic, their magic attainments could not be measured by a human mage standard. However, Cade managed to fight the Minotaur on equal terms. Even if Cade's magic increased and his magic pressure was comparable to a magus, he was still a master mage. Unless he had Saint-Tier magic item focusing on defense, he would not be able to withstand a Minotaur's assault. Jax did not find Cade's armor to be extraordinary. So he was sure it was not a saint tier magic item. Then how come even when the Minotaur's attack just bombarded him, was he able to counter immediately as if he was not hurt? In theory, any human who got bombarded like that by a Minotaur, even with an abjure, would end up in a mess and might even be on the verge of losing consciousness. But Cade was not. Could it be, the rumored Regis blessing? Jax suddenly thought, and his eyes widened in shock. He recalled what the army had recorded about the Regis Blessing. If he remembered correctly, contrary to most thought, the Regis Blessing was not draconic magic in its pure sense, but dragon techniques. A Regis must first meet the qualification to be granted a drop of real dragon's blood. 
then in a sacred ceremony, they had to integrate this drop of blood into their system fully. Once they completed the blood integration, then it was time for them to learn the dragon techniques. Because, if the integration of the dragon blood failed, it would have been meaningless to teach the dragon techniques to them. After all, these techniques could only be used by dragons. But they said there hadn't been new mages from the Regis who was successful in integrating the dragon's blood. Is Cade the last one from his generation? Jax wondered. Still, Jax was convinced it might be the case because, although Chiron, a new generation of the Regis family, had abnormal physical strength, Vera reported that it was within the acceptable abnormality. Rorf. The Minotaur's flaming armor burst out, however, it failed to damage the spears. Jax squinted his eyes, trying to check on Cade. Slowly, the dust and flames subsided and revealed the scene inside. The Minotaur glared at the spot in front of him while still pinned in position. When the dust and flames in front of the Minotaur cleared, it revealed Cade, now clad in a full black obsidian armor. However, on a closer look, the armor had a faint texture of dragon scales. Cade's headgear moved from the top and slowly rolled down and revealed his face. Is that it? Cade said while looking at the Minotaur, however, Jax faintly sensed he was asking him. Rorf! The Minotaur roared and snapped his head as if trying to reach Cade and bite his head off. He continued to struggle out of the spears. Jax stood rooted in his spot. He could summon his magic and help the Minotaur break free. However, the exchange that happened between Cade and the Minotaur was etched deeply in his mind. He already knew that he would not be enough to deal with Cade even if he managed to release the Minotaur. Even if he and the Minotaur joined hands, they would not be able to break Cade's defenses. His offense is quite strong as well, Jax thought and could not help but scowl. REBVEL.C. In theory, abjurers who focused on defense magic had weak offensive magic. However, Cade's innate magic was good both as defense as well as offense. And with the use of the Regis Blessing, it seemed his magic has gotten stronger. Jax remembered that before Cade's magic increased, the Minotaur was able to destroy his magic easily. No answer? Cade asked again. Jax closed his eyes for a moment before opening them again. He took a deep breath and looked at the summoning token in his hand. Return, he said. The token glowed red and a ceiling rune appeared on the Minotaur's head. The flaming armor burst and engulfed the Minotaur before turning into a small whirlwind. Cade watched indifferently as the whirlwind shrunk and disappeared. His eyes returned to normal, and the spears in front of him reformed into obsidian rocks before disappearing. Finally, he turned around and looked at Jax, who was also looking at him in silence. Chapter 61 Outnumbered After being transported through the array, Vera and her team appeared inside a small round, poorly lit working area underground. Its only source of light was a faint glow coming from small magic orbs mounted around the walls. Once their eyesight adjusted to the dim room, they noticed a small opening leading to a tunnel most likely connected to the entrance from their left. Vera also noticed that the size of the tunnel could only fit two people at most. She roamed her eyes and found another opening above them where an intricate array formation hovered in the air. The array formation above was round, and at the moment, it was not active. It had several layers of smaller arrays inside with complex rune writings along its borders. Vera recalled the details of their operation in her head. After phase one of their operation, where they needed to activate the Heaven's Rupture Array, the next phase was the infiltration. They would have to go to three different locations during this phase to enter the Regis Inner Wall premise. Once each team arrived at their respective locations, they would need to activate the array formation prepared beforehand. The array was an attack array that, once activated, would emit a ray of concentrated energy in a straight line. Using this attack, they would blast a hole on the ground above them. Because right above them was the inner premise of the Regis inner wall. Alright, take out the spirit stones and we'll activate the array at once. Vera ordered her team at once. Yes, Captain. All members get to work as they took out different types of spirit stones from their space storage. Since they had to conceal the activation of the array, they could not use their own magic energy and infuse it into the array formation. Thus, they would use the energy of the spirit stones. To do this, they need to use low-grade spirit stones to build up the formation's energy. If they used a high-grade spirit stone at the start, the formation might get out of control and backfire on them. Their target time to complete the array's completion was a quarter of an hour. So far, they still have plenty of time left. Good. We're on schedule. 
Vera thought as she looked up at the array formation. Eight army officers positioned themselves below the array and activated the low-grade spirit stones they had. Soon the outer runes inside the array lit up as it started to absorb the energy of the stones. When the array formation almost absorbed all the energy of the stones, they took out new ones and prepared to activate them at once. The rest of the officers were on standby. When the eight officers started to use high-grade spirit stones, the runes around the array finally moved. It rotated within the circles and activated the smaller arrays one after another. Vera smiled. Her heart started to beat excitedly. She rarely got excited about starting an operation, but today was an exception since she could get even with Chiron by targeting his own people. However, before the array could fully activate, she suddenly felt the token Jax gave her grew warm. She took out the token to inspect it, but there was nothing wrong apart from it getting a little warm. Is this normal? Vera wondered. She knew this was a summoning token. But it was her first time to see and touch it. Shaking her head, Vera shoved the token back inside her pocket and continued to observe the array above. Just then, she noticed her communication device lit up. Equals 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 equals. For a couple of minutes, Kate and Jax only stared at each other. Both of them were trying to gauge what the other might be thinking and what he would do next. Finally, Jax was the first to break the silence. The Regis blessing is indeed formidable, he said. Once again, Cade was surprised at Jax's attitude. He did have an idea of what Jax might be up to and decided to remain silent. As expected of a Regis. You really keep to your principle of not attacking an unarmed person, Jax continued to make conversation. A faint smile appeared on Cade's face as he raised both of his brows. He replied, unarmed? I doubt a mage can really be called an unarmed person. Jax chuckled and slightly nodded his head, point taken. Silence. Cade's expression remained unreadable. However, his initial suspicion of what Jax was up to become more apparent. He's buying time, he thought. Is he trying to contact the others to return? Thinking back, the officers with Jax were too few compared to the number he initially expected. However, Kate already knew what they were up to and made Raya and Mist wait at the locations he expected them to appear. Unbeknownst to Jax and even to the rest of the Regis elders, Kate was already aware of the army's plan and digging their way inside the Regis inner wall. After all, he knew the weakness of his defensive array. Unfortunately, he could only wait for the day the army made their move to act as well. Because of the Regis clan's delicate situation, Cade could not initiate the attack against the army. If he did, the army would exploit what they did and turn the public opinion against them after they revealed the truth of their situation. He suddenly hoped Chiron would also keep a low profile. Knowing his son, and judging by the army's suddenly aggressive move, however, he probably did something that angered them. If this situation were happening in another clan, they would probably condemn their clan member for acting rampant. But to Cade, no. To the whole Regis family, the more Chiron acted rampantly, the more they would feel reassured. Not that they tolerate such behavior. It was just that Chiron rarely acted out. And that worried them. Because whenever he did, he ended up hurting someone and himself. Chiron would definitely grow as a person because of this. Lord Cade, Jax's voice broke Cade's thoughts. Major, Cade replied. Should you really be wasting your time here? Jax asked. Cade smiled. Why major? Is my presence boring you? Not at all. I prefer it to be honest. But aren't you worried while you're idling here your defensive array will be destroyed? Jax replied and looked behind him where the Heaven's Rupture array was still trying to destroy the Regis's defensive array. Cade lifted his gaze and looked at the violet veil spreading over the Regis barrier. He said, I am actually more worried about what you're plotting right now dash dot. Boom! The two transportation arrays near Jax exploded, and two enormous monsters suddenly appeared. One of the two monsters was a ferocious-looking ogre with dark green skin. His head was full of scars, and his height and build were the same as the Minotaur. In his hand, he held a huge club with spikes. The other one was a seven-meter-tall cyclops wearing two flaming gauntlets. He was not buffed compared with the Minotaur and the ogre, but his height could already threaten any mage. Rorf! Both of them roared, spitting out saliva in the process. Another explosion occurred behind the two monsters, and a whirlwind appeared. The Minotaur, looking as if he did not suffer earlier, appeared from the whirlwind. 
he did not roar, but his menacing eyes were looking at Kate. Behind the two monsters, he saw two silhouettes of humans. I suppose, you did not expect there to be more of these monsters. Jax's voice came from behind the minotaur. Kate's eyes narrowed as he saw the monsters. He watched as Jax came in front of the monsters. The other two silhouettes stepped out from the smoke and joined him. A captain, he thought after recognizing one of the two people who joined Jax, from the records their scouts were able to collect on the army personnel. The man was wearing a green uniform and was looking at him indifferently. Kate turned his attention to the girl who was wearing a similar green uniform. He did not know her, but he knew she was also a captain based on the bronze badge she was wearing. REBVEL.C. Unlike the man, the woman was glaring furiously at Kate. However, he had a feeling that she was not really looking at him. I already know you're trying to buy time. So you actually called for reinforcements, Kate replied. He observed the monsters and noticed they were docile. When Jack summoned the Minotaur for the first time, Kate had the impression that summon monsters were hostile. Well, since my Minotaur can't deal with you alone, I reckon more hands might do the trick. Jax replied. Don't worry. These summons are tamer than you think. Since they come from the same group of summoning tokens, they will listen well to orders. Kate smiled, I see. No wonder they're acting docile. You are very strong, Lord Kate. But today, we will do everything in order to succeed in this operation. We cannot fail, Jack said. What a coincidence. I can't fail in this operation as well, Kate said. Before Jax and the others could react, Kate already made a move. Chapter 62 Overturn Go! Jax shouted right after Kate moved. The three monsters roared. They moved to intercept Kate's advance. Among the three, it was the Minotaur who was ahead. Although the Minotaur and the Ogre's size difference was not apparent, he moved slower because the Ogre's flesh had more weight than the Minotaur. On the other hand, the Cyclops moved slowly, however, he could still keep up because of his long strides, thanks to his long lower limbs. Silver arrays circled Cade's obsidian gauntlets. He had no intention of avoiding these monsters. But he dare not neglect Jax and the other two captains' movements while he faced the summon monsters. Suddenly, the Cyclops jumped. The whole ground trembled, and Cade immediately stopped. Not good, he thought with narrowed eyes as the Cyclops raised his fists high above his head while in midair. The other two monsters veered to the side. They avoided the spot where the Cyclops would land while still running toward Cade. Cade jumped back in time before the Cyclops landed on the ground while simultaneously slamming both his fists on the spot where he was just at. The whole ground exploded from the impact, creating a huge crater. Right after that, the Cyclops' gauntlets burst out a straight line made of fire that went toward Cade, who just landed on the ground a few meters in front. Obsidian shields appeared on all sides of Cade and enclosed him. The shields protected him from the debris as well as the scorching flame. This flames! He was shocked the moment the flames hit his shields. The flames used by the Cyclops were superior to the Minotaur's flames. Sensing that the shields had started to melt from the flames, Kate immediately urged his magic to continuously reinforce the shields. When the Cyclops' flame attack subsided, the Minotaur appeared at Kate's right side and rammed his shield. NGH. Kate gritted his teeth as he got blasted to his left. Then. Rorf. These guys. Kate's eyes narrowed as he noticed the ogre with his spiked club raised above his head was already waiting for him to his left. Surprisingly, the three monsters were actually working together. This is starting to get troublesome, Cade thought, clearly perturbed. Five silver rays appeared in succession on the ground leading to the ogre. Thick walls made of obsidian rocks rose from each ray. Cade hit the first wall, which greatly reduced his momentum of getting blasted toward the ogre's side. However, the ogre did not stand idle. As soon as the walls appeared, he swung his spiked club and smashed the nearest wall. The Cyclops and the Minotaur also followed suit and ran to their side. Cade's dark gray eyes flashed. It glowed silver as his pupil turned into slits. His armor shifted and covered his whole body. With three walls left between Cade and the ogre, his magic pressure burst out as the obsidian shields around him turned into smaller pieces of obsidian rocks. These rocks turned into a 2.5 meter long spear which Cade grabbed with his right as he turned to face the incoming ogre. First take one of them down. He thought. Cade lifted the spear to his right. 
and with enough momentum left from when he got blasted, he stepped his left foot forward and released the spear aiming at the ogre. Jax, Luca, and Vera all looked on with wide eyes. They did not expect Cade to initiate a counteroffensive right after getting hit by the Minotaur. Because there were still walls between the ogre and the spear, the ogre did not see the incoming spear and continued to rush toward the next wall. He smashed it with his spiked club without breaking a sweat. As the spear gained momentum, a small orb of dark purple energy appeared on its spearhead, and energy around was drawn into it. Dark purple energy coiled on the spear's shaft and the air around it crackled as if trying to penetrate the space. That spear! Jax is exclaimed as he remembered an old rumor about the Regis family. The rumor was that one of the reasons the royal family did not dare subdue the Regis family after they decided to close their doors was because the Regis spear could easily penetrate the space and destroy everything. Jax thought it was a manner of speech, thinking that the Regis spear mentioned in the rumor was about the Regis's strength. After seeing the spear, Cade created, however, Jax wondered if the spear in the rumor was actually a real weapon. When the spear was only a few feet away from the last wall, the dark purple energy's force immediately blasted the whole wall and went straight to the ogre. No! Jax, Luca, and Vera exclaimed. The three of them felt that the ogre's defense would not withstand the spear's force. Vera's eyes narrowed. Because she was the one who summoned the ogre, she would not let him be destroyed. She moved at once and lifted both her arms. She aimed her hands at the space between the spear and the ogre, and a yellow array started to form in that space. Whoosh! The spear shattered the array without much suspense. G-U-H! Vera splurted a mouthful of blood as her magic backfired. Vera! Luca and Jax exclaimed. Luca rushed to her side before she dropped to the ground. He knew very well how bad the damage one would receive after a magic attack backfired. After all, he experienced it recently. He took out a healing pill and handed it to her. Take this, he said and helped her drink the pill. I'll leave Vera to you, Jax told Luca and rushed to the battlefield. Yes, Luca replied. Vera wanted to protest. However, knowing her body had not fully recovered yet and even took damage after her magic backfired, she knew she would only be a burden. Luca, on the other hand, was once again reminded how his magic lacked the offensive capability. It was frustrating that in this kind of fight, he could only watch and provide support. Jax did not want to admit it, but he had underestimated Cade's strength. The accident that almost crippled Cade did not mean his overall strength had diminished. Most likely, he focused on strengthening himself to cover up his flawed magic. Back to the side of the battle, the spear finally arrived before the ogre. The ogre swung his spiked club to counter the spear. But. Rorf. The ogre roared in agony as the spear blasted the spiked club and also destroyed his arms in the process. Luca's eyes widened as he saw this scene. Just how much power did that spear have? His question was answered when the spear's momentum did not stop and continued to pierce the ogre's chest. A huge hole appeared on the ogre's chest, and the mixture of blood, flesh, and internal organs gushed out from the ogre's back the moment the spear went through. The ogre's agonized expression was frozen as he started to fall. But before he touched the ground, his whole body had already disintegrated. At the same time, Vera's summoning token shattered. Jax, Luca and Vera were shocked by this. With just one hit, the ogre was completely destroyed. Rorf! The Cyclops and the Minotaur roared in anger the moment the ogre disappeared. The Cyclops rammed his fists on the ground and broke it again. The Minotaur jumped just in time to avoid getting hit. While in midair, he grabbed one broken piece of debris that flew near him and burned it before throwing it at Cade. Cade looked at the incoming burning debris and raised his right hand. As if being drawn by an invisible force, the spear that had pierced the ogre turned and returned to Cade. The Cyclops' gauntlets burst, and he also punched the pieces of debris that were in the air. These pieces of debris all flew toward Cade like small meteors. Cade grabbed the spear with one hand. Dark purple energy coiled at the spearhead and when the burning pieces of debris were only a few meters away, he swept the spear in front of him. The dark purple energy was released, forming an arc, and went straight to the incoming pieces of debris. The moment the dark purple energy hit all the debris, it all broke into pieces. Jax's eyes narrowed, seeing how effortlessly Cade countered the attacks of the Cyclops and the Minotaur. REBVEL.C. No time to hesitate. He thought and finally roused his magic. Jax spread his arms, 
and light red arrays appeared one after another on his arms. More rays appeared and circled the whole area where Cade and the monsters were fighting. Noticing Jax's movement, Cade looked at the light red arrays slowly enclosing the area around them. He sighed and looked at the monsters who were still approaching. I want to take care of these guys though, he thought sounding a little disappointed. Cade took a deep breath and swung his spear to the side. He crouched a little before dashing toward the Minotaur. Rorf! The Minotaur roared as he also dashed toward Cade. Cade suddenly stopped. As he dragged the spear to his side, dark purple energy already could on the spearhead. Then he aimed the spear, not at the Minotaur but Jax. Luca and Vera, who saw the scene, could not help but gasp. Major! They exclaimed. Chapter 63 The Flaw Humph, Jax sneered as he saw the spear coming his way. Before the spear reached him, the light red arrays he summoned finally connected and fully enclosed the whole area. Immediately, the area was engulfed by a light red veil, and all movements, magic activity, even the sound inside stopped. The spear also stopped halfway and fell to the ground. What just happened? Vera wondered out loud when the light red veil appeared. From their standpoint, they could no longer see anything inside the enclosed field. Luca's eyes narrowed. He had been under Jax's leadership for a couple of years now, but he had never seen Jax used his magic before. Looking at the enclosed field in front of them, Luca suddenly had an inkling that Jax's magic was not the main question here, but how he could create this veil. Jax was not a magus, but this enclosed field looked like a domain. This is, not a domain, is it? Vera said in confusion and looked at Luca. She was originally not part of Jax's leadership, thus, she was unfamiliar with everyone's magic. Luca shook his head, I'm not sure. It looks like a domain, but... You haven't seen Major Jax use his magic before? No, Luca answered with a slight shake of his head. He usually works alone. If he works with the rest of us, he only provides support. Vera's brow creased slightly, but she did not pursue the topic and only looked back at the enclosed field in front of them. Since they could not see what was happening inside, they could only wait. This also gave Vera time to absorb the healing pill she took and recover a little. Vera shifted and moved into a sitting position. Luca, sensing this, also moved aside to give her space. Luca, I'll try to recover from my wounds. Please take the first watch, she said. Luca nodded, go ahead. I'll arrange for reinforcements as well. Thanks. While Vera meditated, Luca got to work and sent out coded messages to the remaining teams on standby back at their makeshift camp. After receiving a reply that reinforcements were on the way, he sat cross-legged on the ground and observed the enclosed field. This turn of events was not part of any scenarios in their operation. When Luca received a message from Jax to return, he was alarmed because Jax would never order him to return if it was not an emergency. That was why he and Vera immediately used the transportation array to return. The setup of the transportation array at the underground working area was different from the one at the tent. If the previous transportation array would automatically activate once it had 12 people inside, the one at the working area would activate as long as you roused your magic into the array. Of course, it would not activate with just any magic. As long as the magic signature came from any of the team officers, it would activate. This setup was one of the safety measures they had in case the infiltration failed, and they had to escape. If the array had the same setup as the one at the tent, then they would be trapped if their number did not meet the minimum requirement to activate it. Having the array recognized only a specific magic signature also prevents pursuers from activating the transportation array because it would not be recognized. Luca took a deep breath and crossed his arms. Before the start of their operation, they already reviewed the abilities of the Regis's leaders. In case they encountered them, they prepared countermeasures to escape. Yes, escape. They did not plan on fighting them head on. The gap of their level was too big, and if they get into a fight, they would only be throwing their lives. The summoning token Jax gave them was also another countermeasure. They were supposed to use it when they met any of the Regis elders, as well as the Patriarch and his son. In their opinion, the strength and the defense of the summon monster would be enough to keep them busy. Who would have thought that even after Jax used his summoning token to deal with Cade, he would still be in a bind and would even call Luca and Vera over? And even after having three monsters face him, Cade didn't look pressured at all. Luca remembered how Cade easily destroyed the ogre with a single spear attack and shivered. He's an abjurer, right? How come his offense was strong as well? He thought. 
Even if Cade mastered two specializations, there would definitely be a level gap from his initial specialization to the second. But Cade showed he was good at both, which was scary. Cade's strength was too unexpected that Jax was even forced to use his magic. Luca wanted to believe that Jax's magic could really counter Cade. Since Jax did not tell them to retreat before he went to battle, it meant he was confident enough. Please be safe Major, Luca prayed sincerely in his heart. Equals 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 equals. Inside the strategy meeting room at the inner wall defense headquarters of the Regis inner wall. Patriarch Aaron and the rest of the elders were currently observing the three projections on the table. Two of the projections showed Raya and Mist's current location. They were already in position and were waiting for the Royal Army's infiltration squad to appear. The last projection, which was also positioned at the center of the table, showed Cade's battlefield. From the start of the Royal Army's attack, all of them had been watching. Right now, they were staring at the light red enclosed field that Jax used to trap Cade with him and the monsters inside. Normally, the panel watching such a situation would be anxious to know the odds of their own man inside the entrapment. However, the expressions of the elders and the patriarch remained indifferent. This attitude was proof of their trust in Cade. Jax is not part of any clan, however, he managed to enter the royal army and even become a major. This means he is capable, Greer commented as if they were watching a normal occurrence. As the person in charge of the assessment team, he was familiar with all the information of the Royal Army personnel stationed at their premises. Although the summoning tokens were not part of their current information, its addition had minimal effect on their overall strategy. Aaron nodded his head and said, this would be the first time he showed his magic inside the Regis estate. Correct, Greer agreed. We know that he is a support mage with a possibility of becoming an enchanter if he becomes a high master. Unfortunately, we can't confirm what it is. Even the Conclave does not have any record of when he used it in battle. Meaning the Royal Army put a tight lid on it, Aaron smiled sideways. Do you think this field is a domain? Arabella asked and looked at him. No. The magic fluctuation from it is too crude. His level might have reached the threshold of a high adept though. He should have already been promoted, why he remains a major may mean there is a flaw in his magic, Aaron replied. He contemplated for a moment before an idea crossed his mind. Maybe there is a condition he has to meet in order to use his magic. Or he has a usage limit. Makes sense, Abe agreed. If he was promoted to a lieutenant colonel, he will be transferred to one of the Empire's borders and participate in overt operations. If he can't use his magic at will, he will be a deterrent in their battle strategy. Aaron nodded in agreement. His eyes narrowed, and he said, the royal family will only recognize and promote those who they can use. REBVEL.C the atmosphere inside the room suddenly darkened. It was not a secret that the Regis clan had differing principles from the royal family. The public believed that this was why the Regis closed their doors and decided to live in seclusion. It was to prevent any war if both families fought for their own principles. However, this was not the case. Because even when the Regis had their doors open, they were already in an estranged relationship with the royal family. Patriarch, Eleanor spoke and broke the tension. What is it? Aaron asked and looked at her. Earlier, when Lord Cade said that the army's movement was not a trap, you asked if he noticed it. I was wondering what you meant back then? She asked while looking at him. Aaron smiled faintly and answered, the army's movement was deliberate. They wanted to let us know that they are planning something and to prepare beforehand. Except for Abe, the rest of the Regis elders all gasped in surprise. Why would they do that? Zenith asked. Aaron looked back at the projection and replied, Most likely, Major Jax, the one in charge is not that receptive in executing their operation. Chapter 64 Arkham The elders exchanged confused looks. Abe then looked at the projection and fell silent. Before the battle erupted from Cade's side, they could only see the tent. They were not able to see what was happening inside. Even if they could, they would not hear what they were saying. But Abe noticed that there were a few minutes before the battle started. If it was him doing a covert operation and he was found out, he would first talk. Of course, it would also depend on the other person. If he were sure the other person was unreasonable, he would proceed with their backup plan and retreat to safety instead of talking. Jax's had the advantage in number, but Cade was a level above all of them. On top of that, he was an abjurer. Abe wondered if Cade requesting to handle the operation had more meaning to it. 
Lord Cade specifically went to where the leader of the operation would be. Did he plan to talk to the leader before doing anything? Abe wondered out loud. Aaron nodded, that's right. However, Jax might have said something that did not sit well with Cade. That's why it led to a battle instead. If there is another chance, I hope Cade will try again. Talk about what exactly? At this point, I don't see any point in talking to them. Eleanor commented with a slight frown. Hearing Eleanor's doubt, the rest of the elders were also confused. Wasn't it too late to talk to them? After all, they had been at odds for almost a week now. Besides, the army obviously had plans to kill them if they would fight back. Those summon monsters were proof. Although Cade made the monsters look like harmless cute creatures, if those monsters were unleashed inside the Regis' inner wall, they could easily massacre many of their clan members before they could kill one. Aaron smiled. He looked at Eleanor and answered, the talk is just an excuse to gather intel. Gather intel? Aaron nodded and looked back at the projection, yes. Forgive me, patriarch. I still don't understand, Eleanor said in confusion. The royal family will only recognize and promote those they can use. Aaron repeated with a slight smile. Then why is Jack still in the army? The elders exchanged glances once again. It means someone is keeping him there. Aaron continued without waiting for the elders to answer. Now, who has the power to keep someone, who the royal family would deem useless, in the army? The Grand Marshal, Eleanor replied. Correct. Now, why would the Grand Marshal want to keep Jax and defy the royal family? Most likely, though he can't utilize magic in overt operations, it might be different in covert operations. Every elder suddenly realized something, and their eyes narrowed. We all know how obsessed the royal family is when it comes to those mages reported or confirmed practicing or using forbidden magic. They would make a deal out of it. However, they are dealing with our situation differently. Initially, we all agreed that the royal family was trying to keep this incident under wraps because they did not want to spread unrest to the whole empire. After all, we're talking about the most feared forbidden magic. Not to mention, our clan is involved. They even limit the army's movement by making use of the mercenaries to search for my grandson. However, Jax's unexpected action made me realize something. It seems we have it all wrong right from the start, Aaron explained. So this is the real reason why their manpower is limited? Arabella said with an incredulous expression as she slowly understood everything. The others also could not help shaking their head after realizing what Aaron was trying to say. We're only dealing with the army. No. At most, maybe only a part of the army. Zenith added with a thoughtful look. Aaron nodded in agreement. Yes. We can already confirm that the highest authority we're dealing with is the Grand Marshal because of Jax's involvement. However, why is he not using more high-rank officers in dealing with us? Abe suddenly shook his head in disdain, obviously, the royal army has their own power struggle. After failing to take the young master, the Grand Marshal did not want this to be known by the other deputies. Correct, Aaron agreed. Greer sighed, no wonder that man, Jax, was brave to give us a warning. He is not afraid of being found out because there is no royal family involved to enact severe punishment. The Grand Marshal also cannot punish him openly because if he did, then the rest of the army and even the royal family might find out what he was up to. And that is what Cade wanted to find out by talking to them. I also find the Grand Marshal's reasons to keep this operation a secret, strange. Especially with the conditions, they set when they requested a bounty to the mercenary hall. Take the young master alive, Greer said with narrowed eyes. The others fell silent. They now had a general idea that the Grand Marshal might be plotting something that involved taking Chiron alive. He was not using the whole army, which meant he did not want the other deputies to know his plans. This in itself was good for the Regis. They just had to plan their next course of action properly and not alarm the rest of the army and the royal family. Previously, they were on the defensive because they did not have the ability to fight the whole army. However, if it was only a part of the army, then that was a different story. It would be easier for them to plan a counterattack as long as they knew which part of the army they were dealing with. Now, they only had to wait for Cade to confirm everything. Equals 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 equals. Inside the light red field. Jax wiped the sweat off his forehead with his sleeves as he looked at Cade's spear that fell on the ground. It had been a close one. 
If his arrays did not connect and activate on time, this spear would have hit and destroyed him. He took a deep breath and then looked at the monsters who had stopped moving. Both the Cyclops and the Minotaur had a fierce look on their faces, but their eyes had lost their focus. As if they were looking at something, and yet they were not really looking at anything. Leave them for now, Jax thought. Finally, he turned and looked at Kate. Kate was in the same position when he threw the spear, just before Jax's magic activated. With Kate's armor hiding his face, though, Jax could not see his expression. Him not moving is enough proof. My magic was able to penetrate his senses, Jax thought with a slight smile. Jax's magic was a mirage. Once he managed to trap his target inside his veil, their five senses would fall into an illusion. Normally, the illusion was a continuation of the things they initially thought were happening. Thus, his target would not be able to notice that he was already inside an illusion. However, Jax was not aware of what his target was seeing. He could only deduce. In Kate's case, he probably thought he succeeded in hitting Jax with his spear and was now busy dealing with the Cyclops and the Minotaur. Similarly, the monsters were also seeing an illusion of their own. Still, trapping all five senses of these three took a lot of my energy. And this veil is constantly consuming my reserves, he thought as he took out two bottles of dark blue liquid from his space storage ring. These two bottles were high-grade energy replenishing potions. Normally, half of a high-grade replenishing potion would be enough to replenish his energy. Now, half of it could barely keep him from fainting due to energy depletion. After downing the two bottles, Jax threw the empty bottles to the sides and took out his dagger. Finally, he started to walk toward Cade's position. Of course, he would not just stand idle while Cade was in his own illusion. Now that Cade was not moving, this would be the perfect time for Jax to deal him fatal damage. He looked at the flames on the Cyclops' gauntlets and lifted his hand. Light red arrays formed on his palm as he aimed it toward the Cyclops. The flames on the Cyclops' gauntlets shifted and flew toward Jax's direction. When the flames arrived in front of his palm, he controlled it and integrated it into his dagger. REBVEL.C. It was not that Jax was incapable of summoning fire magic. But his fire element affinity was too low that he could not use it to attack. Besides, he noticed that the flames from the Cyclops gauntlets dealt more damage to Cade's shield than the Minotaur. If Jax wanted to break the defenses on Cade's armor, then Jax would need a strong flame that could penetrate it. Well, Lord Cade, time to end this dash dot. Exactly, you took your time. W. -A. The suspended arm of Cade suddenly moved and grabbed Jax's face before he could even react. Arkham! Cade shouted. Golden runes shot out from Cade's arms and circled Jax's body, binding him. Ah! Jax screamed in pain as the runes penetrated his magic defenses and went through his clothes. These runes sunk into his skin and engraved themselves all over his body. A golden rune appeared on his forehead, and soon his eyes lost their focus. Chapter 65 Regis Special Force Captain, Luca The leading officer from the reinforcement saluted at Luca as soon as they arrived. Luca nodded his head and gestured for them to be at ease. He also noticed that the team with Jax earlier was included in their numbers. Good, I thought there had been casualties earlier when I did not see them. Looks like Major Jax ordered their retreat on time, he thought. Major Jax is still inside this field with Lord Cade. We have yet to know the situation. For now, everyone will be on standby. We'll proceed according to plan. If we first hear from the two infiltration teams inside the Regis inner wall, we'll provide reinforcements as needed. Then the rest will stay and support the Major. Luca told them. Yes, Captain Luca. Harris, you and your members will guard Captain Vera while she is recuperating. Harris, a man with short dark brown hair and green eyes and green uniform, stepped out from among the officers and saluted. Yes, Captain. He replied. Together with three more officers in green uniforms, Harris went to Vera. Vera was still sitting on the ground, meditating. Leighton, Luca turned to a man among the members of Jax's team. Sir, Leighton stepped forward. He was a man with light brown hair and black eyes. Unlike most of the reinforcements assigned to Luca and Vera's squad, Leighton and the rest of his team were wearing a red uniform. Could you give me a brief report of what happened before the confrontation with Lord Cade started? Luca asked. Yes, sir. For the next few minutes, Luca listened to Leighton's report. His brows creased when he heard Lord Cade's words when Jax rebuked the Regis's decision to hide Chiron. 
Luca also thought Kate had a point. But what got his attention was how Jax used the summoning token when Kate had not even attacked. At first, Luca thought Jax could have made the first move to catch Kate off guard, but he was surprised that the battle started because Kate said something about the royal family. Luca turned to Leighton and asked again, Do you remember Lord Cade's exact words before Major Jax summoned the Minotaur? Leighton pondered for a while before saying, Lord Cade said, What would the army do? Experiment with him? Execute him in public? Give him to the royal family too, then Major Jax moved. That's all I remember, Captain Luca. Are you sure Lord Cade said, Give him to the royal family? Not royal army? Leighton nodded his head, I am sure. The others can testify to that. Thanks, Leighton. I want you to lead the rest of your team and continue with the operation. Since you're missing headcount for the transportation array, take Maxim with you. Leighton saluted, Yes, sir. As instructed by Luca, Leighton approached Maxim, a tall, buffed guy with dark brown hair and dark blue eyes in a red uniform. Then they joined the rest of Jax's team before going to the transportation array they were supposed to use. After checking that they had the things they needed, they left at once. Luca only watched in silence as they left because he was thinking about Leighton's report. He was grateful that as a mage, Leighton's memory was good. He even remembered what Cade said. However, even after hearing it, Luca could not make head nor tail out of it. Given to the royal army and, what? Luca pondered. Never did a situation occur that a forbidden magic user was surrendered to the royal family. What Kate said about being experimented upon was true, though. And definitely, the execution part. The more Luca ponder, the more he started to doubt Jax's reason for using the token was to catch Kate off guard. Jax obviously interrupted Kate. But he was not someone who would get angry with anyone just because they said something wrong against the royal family. Not to mention, Kate had not even said anything yet. Scratching his head, Luca took a deep breath. Stop thinking for now and focus first, he decided and looked at the light red field again. The truth, he was starting to worry about what was happening inside. Why is there no movement? It's been more than half an hour since Major Jax summoned this field, Luca thought. His summoning token was still intact, so his summon was still alive. Whether the Cyclops was still fighting Kate or not, he did not know. Unfortunately, the token did not have the ability to let him know what his summon monster was doing. Apart from that, they could not hear anything within the field. Luca's communication device suddenly lit up. He looked at it and read the coded message sent by his team. A smile appeared on his face. His team had successfully entered the Regis inner wall and created the array that would help boost the Heaven's Rupture array from within. Not only them, but Vera's team also completed their tasks without any problem. Now both teams were on their way to perform their second task. His team's second task was to secure the water source located in the southwest area of the Regis inner wall. At the same time, Vera's team needed to find where the Regis were keeping their food supply. Unfortunately, they did not know where the Regis store their food. They only deduced it was somewhere north of the estate because the outer wall's food storage was also there. In terms of transporting foods inside and outside the walls, they should be in the same direction. Jax's team was supposed to infiltrate and control the communication tower. This way, the other two infiltrating teams could work with less obstruction. But since they had been delayed, the other two teams would have to practice double caution. Equals 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 equals. After Luca's team successfully blasted a hole from the underground working area ceiling, they made their way up. But no one expected the scene that greeted them as soon as they surfaced inside the Regis inner wall. An array immediately activated around the hole, and all of them plummeted back into the working area. Some of the members were able to land without a scratch. Some who were unfortunate suffered broken bones. Others who hit their head also lost their consciousness. They had spells to break their fall as mages, but the array used against them had a stunning effect, and all of them failed to summon their arrays. To make matters worse, ten people in black leather armor and half-face masks appeared after they fell back to the working area. The moment these people appeared, Sander, the acting team leader, paled. He recognized their uniform and the insignia of the Regis on their gauntlets. These people were part of the Regis special force. They were small in number, but their teamwork and top-notch abilities could rival the Royal Army's special ops. Furthermore, they were all combat mages with specialized magic. 
they were also the reason the Regis successfully evacuated their people within the inner wall with fewer casualties. After these men appeared, it was a no-brainer what happened to Sander and the rest of his team. The Regis special force subdued them, confiscating all their magic items, including their communication devices. Then tied them up. Sander and the others did not even have a chance to notify Luca that their mission had failed. Then the man who seemed to be the leader of the Regis special force used one of the army's communication devices and even sent out a coded message. How did he know the royal army's coded letters? And all their communication devices had their own magic code to prevent outsiders from using them. But the man was able to use it without a problem. I'm done, the man said and threw the communication device to the side where the gathered army's items were. All yours, he said and turned to another man beside him. The other man nodded, he lifted his hand, and two light golden arrays appeared beneath and above the items. Sander's eyes widened, W what are you going to do? Sander was actually waiting for their side to notice that their signal had not left their spot and realize something was wrong. However, if this man did destroy their devices, then it would alarm the army even more. He was not complaining, but if the others arrived and were ambushed, he would not forgive himself. The other man's arrays rotated and met at the middle, then exchanged places. As soon as the arrays went past each other, the items made crackling sounds. Light green arrays appeared on all the communication devices and hovered above each. The arrays crackled, and the still-conscious army officers witnessed the runes on the light green arrays started to reassemble. This dash! Sander was shocked. But it's impossible. This was clearly rune reconstruction. However, this ability was only a theory. Because if a mage wanted to reconstruct an array, they had to have a clear understanding of the runes used on that array. It was true that a mage could learn and use other runes apart from the runes of their innate magic. However, it was different from understanding it. Basically, a mage was only borrowing already made runes to summon particular magic. It was like writing words without fully understanding each character. Most magic items were composed of different types of rune writings, and one main array would keep them together. The army's communication devices were the same. However, this man from the Regis was actually reconstructing their devices. It meant this man understand every type of runes there were in their communication device. I'm done here, the man finally said after the crackling sounds of the runes within the light green arrays faded. What did you do? Sander demanded. The man with the reconstruction ability looked at him, and a faint smile appeared on his face. Instead of answering, he turned and looked at the man who was leading them. REBVEL.C. Hey, lead. Are we really not going to silence these guys? I mean those still conscious did see me use my ability, he said. Sander paled after hearing this. The man called as lead chuckled. He replied, there's no rush. We still need them. He looked at Sander and smiled, but you're right. We can't have them report back what they see here. Light gold array formed on his palm as he approached Sander. W8. In this situation, it's unlikely that we can report anything back to our superiors. Sander tried to reason. It's not like we can escape from you guys. Why you can actually use us as prisoners of war or dash? The man placed his hand on top of Sander's head. Sander immediately froze in fear. Relax. I did say we still need you guys, the man said with a smile as the light golden array on his hand expanded and multiplied before circling Sander from the top of his head. Ah. He screamed. Chapter 66 Cooperation The situation at Vera's team was a little different. After they were blasted back to the working area, and the Regis special force assigned to intercept them appeared, most of those who were still able to move attacked fiercely. The man leading the Regis special force suddenly unleashed a gravity field which rendered all the army officers unable to move. Then the men in black leather armor moved and knocked them out cold. What happened after was very much the same with the other side. The leader took out a golden disc. It lit up, and after a few seconds, the silhouette of the other leader of the special force appeared. How's everything there, Raya? We're done. Just had to clear the memories of some officers here, Raya replied. With a sigh, the leader shook his head and said, You. Did you forget to knock them out before taking care of their items? Raya laughed uneasily, Ah, well some who were still conscious fell hard and probably suffered head concussion. If we knock them out we might kill them. Lord Cade doesn't want that. Is that really the case? Pete. Yes, lead missed. 
The man who had the reconstruction ability from Raya's end replied when he heard his name. You guys are trying to show off again, aren't you? Mist scolded. Pete also chuckled, it was nice to see their surprised faces. Raya chuckled and grinned at Mist even when he was already glaring at him. Relax, Mist. They only saw Pete in action so it's not really hard to remove that scene from their memory, he reasoned. Is it really? I bet you also showed them you can access their communication devices, Mist said with a deadpan tone. Ah. I think I did. Wait, let me remove that part as well. Raya disappeared from the disc's view, and Mist could not help but sigh. Though the existence of the Regis Special Force was not a secret, the Royal Army's information about them was superficial. If the army found out that they did not provide all the information about their specialized abilities, the army would have more reasons to attack their clan. After less than a minute, Raya returned and said, There. Done removing that part too. Okay. Five members here will take the army's communication devices out and make it appear as if their men were still out doing their task. Then the rest of us will return to point A, along with these guys, Mist said and pointed at the unconscious army officers. All right. Five from our side already left with the communication devices. We're just preparing the array and we'll transport these guys to point A, Raya confirmed. That's good. See you guys back there. Raya nodded before disconnecting. Mist returned the disc to his pocket before looking at the army's transportation array. He was tempted to destroy this array. However, when Lord Cade told them of their mission, destroying the array was not part of it. I wonder what Lord Cade was up to, he wondered. But he was not really worried because he believed that the next Regis Patriarch would never plan something that would harm the clan. Equals 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 equals. Inside the light red field. Cade finally released Jax after almost an hour. Arg! Jax fell on his knees with a thud. When he hit the ground, his knees also gave way, and he fell forward. He tried to support his weight using his arms, but even his arms were shaking. W what did why you do to me? He demanded while trying to get up and catch his breath. Kate sat on the ground and faced Jax before replying, Don't worry. You'd feel weak but you won't die from it. Jax lifted his head with difficulty and glared at Kate. However, even his glare was too weak even to pose any threat. Your superior has some big plans. To want to capture my son alive, Kate suddenly said. Jax's eyes widened after hearing this and cried, H how did you dash? Kate tapped his temple then smiled, I saw it in your head. Saw. You dash. Impossible. Your magic is not dash. What I did just now has nothing to do with. I guess you could say, human magic? So nothing is really impossible. What? Kate only smiled. However, because of the headgear, Jax did not see his expression. Jax suddenly urged his magic. Now that Kate had his guard down, it was the right time to try and escape. First remove the Minotaur and the Cyclops from their illusion and dash. W what? My magic. Jax suddenly exclaimed after sensing that he could not use his magic. Kate took a deep breath and shook his head. Major, this is the third time I felt offended. If I really wanted to kill you, I would have done so earlier. Liar. You threw your spear back there with the intent to kill me. That? No, of course not. I aimed it at you to distract you. After all, I can't let you see me doing this. Cade pointed to the ground. Jax followed where Cade was pointing with a slight frown and finally realized why he could not use his magic. On the ground, there was a thin layer of obsidian rocks. It took Jax only a few seconds to realize that these rocks were arranged in a three-meter radius array with Cade at the center. This was the difference between summoned arrays and written arrays. Once a mage summoned arrays, it could be detected easily because of their faint glow. Written arrays, however, could be hidden. In that instant you created this array? Jax asked in disbelief. The cause of his disbelief was not on how fast Cade created the array but on his immediate decision in creating one. You don't have to be surprised, Cade replied. Even when he was fighting with the monsters, he never stopped observing what Jax and the other captains were doing. The moment Jax summoned several arrays, Cade was already aware and started to think of countermeasures. You weren't exactly hiding when you summoned your arrays, he reasoned. And did you predict that I will approach you and prepare this restraining array to restrict my magic usage? 
Cade became thoughtful as if contemplating his answer. After a few seconds, he finally replied, I suppose, it can be considered as one of its effect. Jax's eyes narrowed from Cade's answer. Did he mean this array had other effects? An array of this scale normally had only one effect. One example was the transportation array. Its effect was to transport people to another transportation array it was connected to. Only those large-scale arrays like the Regis Defensive Array could have multiple effects. Obviously, a small array could only hold simple calculations, while a large array had more complex calculations. Many felt it was such a loss when Cade got into an accident that hindered his magic progress. However, thinking back on his earlier performance and now this array, the accident did not seem to hinder his progression at all. If some of the Empire's people did not witness the accident, Jax would even think that the Regis clan fabricated Cade's accident to hide his real strength. We're getting sidetracked, Cade interrupted Jax's thoughts. Let's go back to the topic of your superior. Jax was silent. Right now, his survival depended on what Cade was up to. If Jax wanted to find a way to escape, he first had to let Cade feel that he was 100% in control. He just hoped Luca and Vera were not doing anything reckless outside. He had to inform them of the plan to retreat as soon as he got out. Thinking of this, Jack stealthily checked for his communication device. By the way, I already tampered with your communication device so don't bother. Cade casually said. Jax froze, but he retained a straight face. In his heart, however, he was already cursing Cade. Just how far was Cade's knowledge in the array formation that he could easily tamper with the army's device? The top of Cade's headgear shifted and rolled down to reveal his face. Are you really going to blindly follow your superior's order? He asked without even waiting for Jax to recover from his initial shock. I am a soldier. But he doesn't even have your loyalty, Cade said. And what do you know? Jax retorted glaringly. Cade smiled. He tapped his right temple and said, A lot. I've checked it. Jax's eyes narrowed, and he said instead, Are you planning to overthrow the royal family? Cade's eyes widened, Please. Why would we do that? Do you know how much work it involves to rebuild an empire after destroying its previous monarch? Protecting the Regis clan already takes too much of our time, why would we even covet the whole empire? Jax frowned. As a major, interrogating people was one of his strong points. Right now, he did not sense any falsehood in Cade's words. Then why? You are a father yourself. I just want to create a place where my son can live normally, Cade answered. REBVEL.C Jax fell silent. Even though the Regis clan were known for their amiable countenance, they were ruthless and feared by many in a death battle. With Cade's strength, he could easily kill Jax, but he did not. Cade's attitude clearly showed that he did not want to start an all-out war with the army. Even when we had killed some of their members, Jax thought. Although both sides suffered fatalities, Jax knew that normal Regis clan members were killed by his men that night. When Jax was deep in thought, Cade was observing him in silence. After searching Jax's memory, Cade already confirmed some of his theories regarding the current situation. He also understood that while Jax respects his superior, he was not afraid to defy him if the order would go against his principle. To Jax, his loyalty lies in his men. Proof of that was when Jax summoned the Minotaur to interrupt what he was saying about the royal family. Because of this, Cade decided to try and talk to Jax again. I want to propose a cooperation, Cade finally said after a few minutes of silence. Immediately, Jax's brow furrowed. Cooperation? Don't worry. I'm not going to make you rebel against your superior. How about you hear me out first? I'll give you a chance to think it over, Cade replied with a slight smile. Chapter 67 This is fine, right? Almost a quarter of an hour after Leighton's team left. Finally, there had been a development in the situation inside Jax's field. Cracks formed around the field as it showed signs of crumbling. By this time, Vera had finished absorbing the healing pill and was on standby with the rest of the army officers. Hm. Luca's brow creased as he felt the summoning token inside his pocket slowly cool down. He took it out and looked at it with a slight frown. Vera looked over and noticed this. She asked, is something wrong with it? Instead of replying to her, Luca immediately looked at the rest of the officers and yelled, Everyone arms at ready. Hearing this, Vera was able to deduce the reason behind Luca's reaction. There was only one reason why he would act this way after checking his summoning token. He must have felt a reaction to the token coming from the summon monster. 
Vera immediately took out her small knife while the officers also took their weapons out. They all looked at the now crumbling white red field with vigilance. No matter what scene would greet them, they had to act accordingly. Suddenly a loud explosion occurred from on the field. Then it was followed by a fierce whirlwind and then an angry roar. A combination of smoke, dust, and whirlwind fiercely swept through the officers who tried their best to stand firm and not be blown away. Erg. Vera blocked her face from the fierce wind using her arms. In between the gap, she observed the scene in front of her. However, she could not make out anything, even a silhouette, because of the thickness of the smoke. Everyone fall back. Everyone heard the familiar voice of Jax amidst the smoke. Major. Luca called out. You've been warned. Another deep voice came and reverberated around them. Luca and Vera strained their eyes to look at what was happening inside the smoke. They both recognized that voice and were suddenly reminded of the horror when the summon ogre was decimated with one attack. Just then, a large silver array appeared above them and made all of them gasp. The silver array was so huge it actually covered the whole heaven's rupture array. No, it actually exceeded its range size. As such a large scale array. Vera exclaimed in shock. Everyone was so shocked that some of them even fell on their knees, trembling. The larger the array, the bigger it needed an amount of magic energy. That was why most large-scale arrays needed other materials like rare stones, forest beast bones, and in rare cases, even grounded internal organs of rare beasts to form the base. It was the same when they created the Heaven's Rupture Array. They used a lot of materials when forming each point. Then they needed to supplement it with more magic energy using their own people. Even Luca needed to use his innate magic to boost it further. Of course, it was true that this array needed more materials because their level was too low. Looking at this array, logically speaking, it would not be possible for one mage to cast it. Only Amagus had the energy reserved to do so. However, when Luca and Vera thought of him, they had an inkling that it was not entirely impossible. Even though he was not even Amagus. More accurately, he could not become Amagus. This will be the last time we will show mercy, the voice said once again. Everyone followed the direction where the voice came. Floating in midair, they saw a man clad in full black armor, surrounded by several different sized silver arrays that rotated around him. Just by looking at him, every officer started to break out in cold sweat. The man's aura was very oppressive. Lord Cade, Luca thought both in awe and fear. Just how much magic energy did this man possess? Was the information about his almost crippled magic progression really true? Or were all direct members of the Regis family simply too abnormal? Luca suddenly remembered how their initial target, Chiron Regis, also showed abnormal strength the first time they met. Even then, Luca did not want to admit it, but that boy was frightening. And now, the man before them was that boy's father. And he was more frightening. If you try any tricks again, we'll enact proper judgment. Cade continued. Look! The array! Someone suddenly shouted. The Heaven's Rupture Array cracked as the Regis Defensive Array repaired itself at an alarming speed with the help of the Silver Array. Luca and Vera, however, ignored the array and looked at Cade vigilantly. A scroll appeared in Cade's hand. Both Luca and Vera immediately raised their weapons. Battle Formation Luca issued an order. Everyone focused on Lord Cade. Vera also shouted. When the officers heard them, they responded immediately and reorganized themselves. The scroll in Cade's hand disintegrated, and a three-meter-wide light golden array appeared under his feet. Tracking squad launch your anti-cast items now. Luca ordered. However, before the rest of the officers could make a move, the light golden array lit up, and Cade disappeared in a blink of an eye. Luca and Vera's eyes widened. At first, they thought Cade would launch an attack using that scroll. Still, he might not have attacked, but the scroll he used surprised them. A transmission scroll? Vera thought in shock. If you think about it, Kate had the ability to escape from them even when he was outnumbered. However, he actually used a rare transmission scroll so casually. An earth-shaking crash sounded around them as the Heaven's Rupture Array finally got destroyed. While the rest of the officers looked back at the now-fading Heaven's Rupture Array, Luca turned his attention back to where the light red field used to be. Major Jax. He called out and ran. Vera, hearing Luca, also followed close by. With the smoke and wind finally abating, the two of them saw Jax on his knees with one hand across his abdomen. Jax's uniform was tattered, 
and he was covered in blood. It looked as if he just survived the death battle. Vera roamed her eyes and immediately noticed the destroyed ground, forming too many craters for her to count as well as burning trees nearby. Just what kind of battle happened here? She also noticed that the Minotaur and the Cyclops were nowhere to be seen. As she suspected from Luca's earlier reaction, the Cyclops must have suffered a fatal wound and possibly rendered unconscious. Unlike the ogre she summoned that got destroyed, which in turn destroyed the summoning token, the Cyclops were only forced to return, thus, Luca's token was not destroyed. Remembering the roar they heard earlier, Vera deduced that must have been the Minotaur's last cry before being rendered out of commission. To think that these summon monsters were supposed to be their trump card and yet Cade handled them single-handedly. A cold chill run down Vera's spine. She was too naive to think that she could get revenge for her member's death once she entered the inner walls. The Regis had transmission scrolls at their disposal, and with a monster like Cade keeping guard, he could easily obliterate them. What are you all doing here? Jax's accusing voice brought Vera out of her thoughts. We are here to provide backup, Major. Luca replied as he helped Jax to his feet. There was no need for that, Jax reprimanded with a slight frown. The operation is a failure, tell everyone to retreat. But Major, both Vera and my team successfully entered the Regis inner wall. The operation is not entirely a failure. What? Jax's eyes narrowed. His brow creased a little as he contemplated for a moment. Lord Cade will definitely order their men to scour the whole premise to check if there are any other breaches. If the holes are people created to get in were found, it will only be a matter of time before the Regis perform a search inside. Tell them to lie low and stay out of the Regis's radar. Vera immediately shook her head and said, but their provisions are not enough. It is not too late to order for their return. Jack shook his head, no. Lord Cade witnessed how the two of you appeared here through an array. We cannot use it again. Nor the passage we created. You also saw him use that scroll. I would not be surprised if all their men carries one for emergency use. Once Lord Cade located those holes, it is easy for him to pass the information to the rest and get their men there at once. But the Regis inner wall is huge, he will not be able to locate it all in a day. We can still dash dot. Captain Vera, did you really think Lord Cade doesn't have a way to locate those holes? Jax asked and looked at the huge silver array above. Luca and Vera also turned and looked at it. I will not be surprised if at this very moment, he is already using that large array to check if there are any foreign magic fluctuations near and within the Regis inner wall. If there's anything I learned after fighting with him, Lord Cade is a cautious man. He can prepare layers upon layers of countermeasures to any form of attack I throw at him. Major is right, besides Sander and the others are trained soldiers, they will be able to survive and find ways to provide for their needs by themselves. Luca agreed and looked at Vera. Right now, they can only stay inside. This way, we also have eyes inside the Regis inner wall. We can only move accordingly. Vera wanted to protest but could not think of any reason to refute their words. She understood what they were saying, but she could not help but feel uneasy. Apart from that, she was mainly concerned with her members' safety. Mika was also there, and among Vera's members, she was the least experienced. The Grand Marshal will not be happy at the failed operation but with our men inside, it will alleviate his temper a little. Jax added. He looked at Vera. We'll get them out eventually, but right now we can only retreat. I understand, Vera finally replied after a short pause. I'll tell Leighton to return. At this time, they haven't reported back yet so they probably haven't activated the attack array yet. Luca said and took out his communication device to send out a coded message. REBVEL.C. Jax nodded and also said, Use our private channel when you contact them to block out any magic fluctuation. We're not sure if signals from our communication devices can be detected. After you send out the orders to Sanders and Gianna as well, we won't contact them anymore. We'll still keep track of their movement, but tell them not to contact us unless it is important. We can't risk being exposed even when they use our private channel. Yes, Major. Luca replied and started sending out coded messages through their private channel. Jax looked at Vera, tell the rest to clear out all arrays. As much as I want to clear out the traces of the passage as well, I cannot risk our men going there and get caught by the Regis's people. Yes, Major. Vera saluted before going back to the rest of the officers. Jax took out a healing pill and swallowed it. He watched as every officer followed Vera to destroy the arrays. 
His eyes narrowed and looked at the now restored defensive array of the Regis inner wall. His eyes particularly observed the huge silver array that was still hovering above the whole Regis inner wall. This is fine, right? He thought. Equals 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 equals. Kate appeared above the huge silver array and overlooked the whole Regis inner wall. After a while, he turned toward the direction where Jax and the rest of the royal army were currently at, and a slight smile appeared on his face. With this, our counterattack begins. Make sure to keep up, Major. He thought. Chapter 68 Molding Technique It was already late in the afternoon at the Tower of Conclave when Stella rushed back to her study with a tray of food floating behind her. Going back a few hours, Stella had planned to keep Chiron company while he read and study magic. That way, if he encountered something he did not understand, she could explain it to him. However, she received a message from Malek through her private channel, telling her about some paperwork they had to deal with the Chamber of Commerce. Thus, she collected some introductory books on magic that Chiron could start with before excusing herself to attend to her duties as the Lord of the Tower. Stella and Malek met at her office, located on the top floor of the South Tower. This office was where she normally met with the council members to discuss business matters of the conclave. Before discussing the Chamber of Commerce business, Stella first asked Malek about the progress on the tasks she assigned to everyone a few days ago. Malek reported that the Tower of Conclave's defensive array was still under construction. Because Chiron's magic did not simply destroy a part of the array, Noir had to create a new blueprint. It was not an issue with Stella because she would still ask Noir to construct a new one even if they could repair the old defensive array. Because she already planned to improve its formation. As for the Mercenary Hall's defensive array, the construction had already started, and their progress had reached 5% in just a few days. This number was actually a good one. After all, they had to create a new array from scratch. After that, they finally moved with reviewing the materials they ordered from the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce delivered some materials the other day, and Malek already confirmed they were in good condition. Then Stella double-checked the quantity of the materials they sent to the Mercenary Hall because the Tower of Conclave also needed almost the same materials, albeit at a higher quantity. The Chamber of Commerce delivered the rest of the materials that afternoon, and Malek and Stella had to deal with another round of logistics and paperwork for hours. Finally, after almost seven hours of working nonstop, she could leave the rest for Malek to handle. When Stella realized the time, she panicked because it meant Chiron had been in her study for almost seven days without a proper meal. She had to ask the cook to prepare a meal as soon as possible, and now, she was rushing back to check on Chiron. As soon as Stella closed the doors to her study, she did not bother to walk toward the mezzanine and directly levitated. She sighed in relief after seeing Chiron still immerse in reading. After descending on the mezzanine, she noticed that he changed his clothes. If other people saw Chiron, they probably would not notice the change because he was wearing the same black shirt and pants, but Stella noticed the shirt's neckline was now V-shaped compared to the rounded one he wore before she left. As for the pants, there were fewer pockets on the side. Good. At least he is still able to properly look after himself, Stella thought with a smile. Then her eyes fell on the books piled at the side of the table, then at the pile of books still on the table. Is it just me, or are there more books than the last time I saw them? She wondered and looked at Chiron, who seemed not to notice her arrival. Stella frowned slightly. But seeing how immersed he was in reading, she just sighed. As she approached him, she saw the title of the book he was reading and immediately stopped. The title of the book was a breakthrough in magic through the years. Stella was positive that the book Chiron was reading right now was not one of the books she gave him. She made a quick scan of all the books near him and realized none of them were the ones she chose. The number of books that Stella had chosen earlier that makes it a few days ago inside her study was not few. If an average person were to read all those books, it would take them months to understand them. But Chiron. He's doing it again. Stella thought in exasperation. She was starting to doubt if the information Malek had collected about Chiron for the past twelve years was even accurate. How come it did not mention, he was such a bookworm? With a sigh, Stella sat on the cushion across Chiron. She arranged the books on the table and moved them to the side to make room for the tray full of food she brought. While she was doing this, she noticed Chiron's left hand holding a clear orb. From the inside, small purple rings were circulating inside. What are you doing? She asked. Startled, 
Chiron gripped the orb on his hand too tight, and one purple ring expanded, splitting it in two. Ah! His brow twitched as he looked at Stella accusingly. Stella, on the other hand, belatedly realized her fault and smiled uneasily, S sorry. I'm just curious as to what you were doing. Then she stopped and frowned before looking at Chiron accusingly. No! That's not it. You! What are you doing again? Are you reading or practicing magic? Focus on one and not multitask. I can use my magic to give you enough time to do both without rushing, you know. Chiron raised an eyebrow at Stella's outburst. He was not sure what she was on about again. Was it really wrong to do two things at the same time? When he finished reading the book Stella brought a few days ago, Chiron wanted to train his magic. However, when he tried to summon his magic, the arrays in the study started to fluctuate. He realized that the more concentrated the magic he summoned, the more likely the whole array inside the study would malfunction. It occurred to him that since he was inside Stella's magic influence thus, his magic was an outsider that could disrupt its flow. Chiron was not disheartened at this discovery, though. On the contrary, he saw this restriction as an opportunity for him. He remembered he was able to use his magic when he burned his notes, so it meant, as long as he did not exceed the maximum capacity of magic that the array could allow, then he could still practice. And it was almost similar to the controlling your magic lesson he had with Nolan. Then he remembered when he and Nolan left the abandoned warehouse the day they visited the Tower of Conclave. Nolan told him to keep the remaining magic orbs to practice. Thus, Chiron took out a magic orb from his space storage and started to practice. Since his assignment was to summon the purple rings on both orbs, and Chiron had no idea how to do it yet, he decided to try and do two different things at the same time first. Maybe he could get inspiration when he practiced this way. And that was how he ended up summoning his magic on one hand while reading at the same time. Reading and summoning my magic is part of the training, Chiron told her and took out another magic orb. Today, he was able to control the fifteen small purple rings inside the orb for almost an hour without destroying it. Of course, to not waste the orb he had, he would cancel his magic immediately if he sensed he could not maintain it. Stella's expression turned thoughtful. REBVEL.C. Part of training? She asked while waving her hand and moved the tray of food on the table. What kind of training? I'm trying to control my magic inside these orbs, Chiron explained. Nolan told me to practice this to improve my magic control. Stella looked at the orb on Chiron's hand and asked, These orbs are magic orbs? Chiron nodded, Yeah. H.M. I can see the logic. Although I haven't heard of magic orbs being used this way. Since you have limited space on where to summon your magic, and that space also had a shape, you are not only learning how to control your magic but also learn the technique of how to mold it. Mold, Chiron repeated and remembered one of his conversations with Nolan about the difference between creation magic and molding your own magic. He also read an introductory and application of this technique from one of the books he read. He looked at the orb and wondered if it was really molding. When Dante molded his earth magic, its shape was distinct and solid as far as he remembered. Compared to what he was doing now, he had to summon fifteen rings while keeping the most minimal space between them to ensure it would all fit inside the orb. Even the barrier he created before, which he now called the void scales, could not be mistaken for a molding technique because his magic had that form after integrating it into the Regis defensive technique. Same when he wrapped his magic around his fist to make gauntlets. The shape of his gauntlets was crude and a far cry from a real one. Looking at his magic rings, he could now control how thin or small they would appear. Now that I can control my magic to this extent, maybe I can really try molding it. Chiron thought. An idea slowly formed in his head. Chapter 69 Arrays Noticing Chiron's thoughtful expression, Stella heaved a sigh. Once again, her presence was easily forgotten by him once he was deep in thought. Even now, Stella could already guess what he was thinking. Although they only met recently, Stella knew about Chiron the moment he manifested his void magic. She was only nine at the time and was not the lore of the tower yet, but her predecessor had ordered Malek, who was already the head of Conclave even then, to file Chiron's profile. The previous Lord of the Tower did not issue the order because he was worried about Chiron's future character. Being born to the Regis family was practically insurance that he would grow to be a decent person. However, part of the list that the Conclave's founder had left them was to create the new Void Master's profile. The Regis family was also aware of the list. Thus, they accepted the Conclave's request as long as they treated Chiron's profile highly confidential. 
Thanks to this profile, Stella could more or less guess Chiron's mood or even what he was thinking just by observing his expression. However, though she could guess his thoughts, she could not keep up with his pace. Chiron was very decisive. If he thought of something, he would do it without delay. Stella had not decided whether his decisiveness was good or just being impulsive. However, one miscalculation on Chiron's part, and he might suffer more than falling unconscious for days. Chiron cancelled his magic and returned the magic orb inside his pouch. Then he turned his attention to Stella and asked, Is there a training ground around here? As expected, Stella thought inside. We do. Can you take me there? An idea popped in Stella's head, and she immediately smiled at him. Tomorrow. I can take you there, she said. Immediately, Chiron's brow creased. Sensing Chiron's shifting mood, Stella immediately added, It is almost nighttime outside. So even if I take you there, no one can assist you with setting up the whole place. Besides, did you forget you just woke up after falling unconscious for days? You probably think you're already okay now that you've woken up, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have fully recovered. Chiron's brow creased further, and he replied, That was nine days ago. Black lines appeared on Stella's forehead. He was actually right. Inside her study, nine days already passed from when he woke up. Still, I'm well rested. Besides, I've been holed up here for more than a week just reading books, now I need to move my body. And don't worry about setting up the training ground, I can do it myself. And I'll mostly train my magic, so I don't need any equipment. Chiron suddenly stopped as he belatedly wondered why he had to explain himself to this woman. She was not even his family nor a close acquaintance. Stella was more of a prospective business partner. Realizing that Chiron would not budge, Stella finally laid down her last card. Okay. The thing is. There are no time array in the training ground. So I'll have to create a new one. But I've been maintaining the time array here for more than nine hours and it's already draining my magic reserves and I'm also physically exhausted right now. There was a, a lot of work I had to deal with outside and dash dot. That's fine. I don't need you to change the time flow in the training ground. As a matter of fact it will be troublesome if you do, Chiron interrupted her. What? Stella looked at him with a deadpan expression. Chiron stood up and looked at the circulating arrays around them. I can't use my magic the way I want to inside your magic, he explained. Oh. It was only then that Stella thought of this. Normally, if a mage summoned his magic in an area dominated by another type of magic, his magic would be restricted. However, Chiron's magic was too powerful that he could easily destroy others' magic. If you're tired, then rest. Just tell me where to find the training ground. I can go there myself, Chiron said and turned his attention back to Stella. With a sigh, Stella finally relented and replied. No, I can take you there. But could you at least, eat first? She gestured her hand toward the table where the tray of food was already waiting. Chiron looked at the table and could not help but sweat at the dishes Stella brought this time. The food was a full course dinner. There were two appetizers, a flatbread with bacon and cheese with soup. Then a three main courses of salmon, grilled beef, and roasted chicken. As for the salad, Chiron was not sure what it was, but it looks, greeny. And there's also a pie for dessert. With this kind of food, Chiron wondered why he did not smell it. Even the one Stella brought a few days ago. He was late to realize what she prepared until he saw it. The vanilla scent here seems to be enchanted dash, he paused and shook his head. No. That's not important right now. He looked at Stella with black lines appearing on his head. You really? Stella just smiled sweetly at him and said, It's been hours since the last time I saw you eat. I know you have a stock of food with you but those are preserved foods, and this here are real foods, or, at least it was cooked recently. Please, humor me. Taking a deep breath, Chiron sat back and did not argue. Besides, the food looked delicious, and he had not eaten yet. Stella brightened and immediately served the food. After a few minutes of eating in silence, Chiron suddenly had a thought. He looked at Stella and said, Can I ask you something? Sure, Stella replied as she leaned toward the table. How come the royal army did not go here even after I've caused such ruckus with my magic? Is Starhorn out of their magic detector's range? This thought had been on Chiron's mind these past few days. After all, he did make that seem to draw their attention. Not really. There's actually a huge magic detector installed at the center of the town square. 
however, the defensive array around Starhorn can camouflage magic signatures. The Royal Army's detectors will have trouble differentiating between each signature it detects. Stella explained. But, wouldn't our magic affect that array? Since I'm guessing our magic is different. You know, just like how I can destroy your array if I'm not careful of the output of magic I use? The array set up around Starhorn is different to the one I have here. The array here is created directly by my magic. While the array around Starhorn is created using different kinds of materials, Chiron suddenly remembered the difference between an array created by magic and an artificially created one from a book he read a few days ago. The array's effect created by magic was normally reliant on the rune calculations around it. In comparison, the other one would rely on the effect of the materials used. Chiron slightly nodded his head and said, I see. So unless I destroy those materials, I will not be able to affect it. Correct. The one who set up the Starhorn's array, is he a magus? If he can create such a large-scale array, that needed a lot of energy, isn't it? And he would need to have a huge magic reserve, like a magus. Stella could not help but smile. It seems Chiron did study not only magic but also arrays. Noir is not a magus oh, by the way, Noir is the one who created Starhorn's array. As well as our towers and the mercenary hall's defensive arrays. You mean, he was able to create such a large array using only his magic reserve? Chiron asked incredulously. Well, if you want to know how he did it, you can ask him yourself when you meet him dash dot. Stella paused before rephrasing her sentence, I mean, when you meet them. Them? He asked. She nodded and said. The Conclave High Council members. Chiron suddenly remembered something and immediately frowned. Right, that guy is also a council member isn't he? Stella froze as she guessed who that guy Chiron was referring to. You still owe me one round with him, he added. Black lines appeared on Stella's head. So he had not given up on the idea of getting even with Malak. Ah ha ha. Yes, I do. Stella replied with an uneasy laugh. REBVEL.C. When will I meet them? Actually, I can arrange for you to meet them now if you're fine with that. Is this your way of distracting me from training? Of course not. Stella denied with a shake of her head. The truth, they have been staying here since the day you arrived. I told them, I'll set up another meeting once you woke up. Then arrange it after my training, Chiron replied with a shrug. I also want to talk to Noor about a race. Are you sure you're okay to meet them after your training? Stella asked again. After all, she was not sure how much time Chiron needed to complete his training. Yeah. I just need to try something out with my magic. I can always continue tomorrow and try it out with that guy. Stella's brow twitched, knowing who the guy was. Ah, all right. Then, I'll arrange for the meeting in four hours. That will be around eight in the evening. Chiron nodded in agreement, sure. Chapter 70 How to Mold Your Magic After Chiron finished eating, he and Stella went to the training ground. The training ground was located outside the Northwest Tower. It was built near the barracks where the security unit resides for easy accessibility. The training ground itself was square in shape, with half was an open field, and the other half was a building with three floors. At one side of the field was the target area for archery. The other side was reserved for field exercises. When Chiron and Stella entered the training ground, he noticed that it was empty even though the whole place was lit. Stella led Chiron to the entrance going to the building. The entrance at the center were huge oak doors. It led to a small reception where two huge double doors were on each side. The door to the left led to a hall where smaller to medium-sized private training rooms were found. And the one on the right led to an arena. An arena? Chiron suddenly asked and looked at Stella. You hold matches here? Stella chuckled after seeing the incredulous look on his face. The matches were actually an assessment. At the beginning of each year, all mages, combat mages, and combat specialists from the security would hold competitive matches among themselves to select the elite team that would guard the main tower. She explained. There was a moment's pause before Chiron replied with, I see. Hearing his curt reply, Stella sneered and guessed, you just thought badly of our elite team, did you? I didn't, Chiron denied with a straight face. Stella giggled and proceeded to the left doors. The members of our elite team are really the best among our talents. Your standard is just too high. They can fight evenly with the Royal Army's field team, you know. She stopped and pushed the double doors open. 
Chiron slightly frowned and said, As I said, I didn't think badly about them. And what's with me having high standards? I don't have any of that. Okay, okay, Stella replied with a laugh and entered. I'm surprised you did not react to what I said about the Royal Army. Joint activities are normal among different military factions. It is a way to assess each faction's current strength while also keeping each other in check, Chiron replied and entered as well. He immediately saw a long hallway up ahead and followed behind Stella. With a slight nod, Stella commented, Right. You learned that from military school. You also had joint activities with other schools, right? Chiron looked at her, Yes. How was it? It was educational. Stella laughed, I can't decide whether you're just honest or conceited. Chiron raised both his brows but did not reply. He had a feeling that no matter what he said, Stella would interpret it differently. To be honest, Chiron did not want to explain nor share his experience in the military school. Especially the joint activities with other military and even magic schools. That was why he said the closest word he could think of to describe his experience. Besides, he had a vague feeling that she already knew all about it. Chiron decided to change the subject and asked, Why is this place empty? Do your people end their practice early? Suddenly, Stella burst out laughing. You're really asking that question? She asked while turning around to look at him. Chiron frowned, I just did. Did you forget how you thrashed my people a few days ago? Stella replied with a raised eyebrow. That was, ah, right, different time flow, Chiron said mostly to remind himself. Stella smiled, yes. Right now, most of them are still in the infirmary. And those who can already move have to help out in creating the defensive array while also maintaining security. Chiron fell silent. He did not mean to forget what he did here a few days ago. But because Stella acted carefree around him, he thought everything was already okay. He actually agreed to meet the Conclave's council members to apologize and explain why he did what he did. If they were not satisfied with just an apology, he was willing to compensate. Sorry. Chiron finally said after a long pause. You can tell them that yourself when you're free, Stella replied with a smile. I will. Then he paused and added. Will they be fine seeing me? I mean, I did hurt them. Stella giggled, probably not. Chiron did not reply and instead pondered how he could apologize before scaring them off. Soon, they arrived in front of the room at the end of the hall. This room was actually the largest medium-sized private training room in the building. The room's height occupied at least two floors, and its width was equivalent to four small private training rooms. With this much space, Stella was sure that Chiron would be able to move around as he pleases. She also chose this room because of its array. All training rooms had an array formation. And each had its own specialties. In this room, it had the ability to reconstruct any damaged area of the room in seconds. With Chiron's magic, if he accidentally destroyed part of the room, it would be able to reconstruct itself in a minute. Of course, if the damage was bigger, then it might take more than a minute. Stella opened the door, and both she and Chiron entered. Chiron slightly nodded his head in approval when he saw the space of the room. The size was just right for him to try out his idea with his magic, given that he succeeded in molding his magic first. The room was painted white. And apart from faint rune writings of array formation written on the walls, floors and ceiling, the whole room was empty. All right. Then I will leave you to your training, while I inform the rest about the meeting. I'll come back thirty minutes before it starts, Stella told him. Okay, thanks. Stella nodded her head before leaving. The moment she closed the door, Chiron walked into the middle of the room. He lifted his left hand and summoned his purple rings. Molding is when you use your magic and shape it into a different form with the solidity of a real object, he thought, remembering the information he read about the molding technique. The three important qualities a mage must possess to mold his magic are attention to details, imagination, and ability to focus. Taking a deep breath, Chiron closed his eyes and cleared his mind. He let his magic circulate inside him and direct it to his palm. Since it was his first time to try out molding, Chiron's first objective was to reshape his rings. First, try a square. He thought and imagined a square solid object. The moment the image in his mind became clear, he felt the rings in his hand shifted. His heart started to pound in anticipation. But he immediately calmed his heart, or else he would lose his focus. The clearer the image in his mind appeared, the more he felt his rings shifting. After a few minutes, Chiron finally opened his eyes and looked at rings in his hand. 
black lines appeared on his head. What in the world is this? He thought in exasperation. In his hand, his rings were still rings. But instead of their usual layered arrangement, there was a horizontal ring at the bottom, four rings in a vertical position formed four sides around the ring at the bottom, and another horizontal ring to form the top. Technically, it was a square, formation. Not a shape. Chiron sighed and cancelled his magic before sitting cross-legged on the floor. He opened his left palm and summoned one purple ring, and glared at it. You can form into a disc, yet you can't fill the gaps when you do that square thing? He scolded. The purple ring simply rotated on his palm. This was not good. Being holed up with only books to accompany him for days made him a little strange in the head. Chiron sighed and lightly shook his head. He closed his eyes to try again. Equals 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 equals. Stella took out a small crystal disc and contacted Malak as soon as she left the training ground. REBVEL.C. This disc was her own communication device with her private channel. She only used it for emergencies, and Malak was the only one who knew its code to contact her. Malak, where are all the council members right now? Stella asked the moment Malak's silhouette appeared on the disc. Lord of the Tower, Malak bowed his head in greeting before answering, more with Sigma and Vanus are currently at the center of the new array formation. It seems there are additional materials Noir needed to complete the core, and they are discussing how to acquire them. Maliet and Avram are at the Alchemy Chamber concocting new supplies of potion for our men at the infirmary while Hugh, Callan and Emery are helping with security rounds. Stella nodded, okay. Tell them to gather in the conference hall at eight. We'll have a meeting. Upon hearing this and knowing that Chiron was already awake, Malek's eyes narrowed. Stella noticed this and could not help but chuckle. It was not only Chiron who wanted to get even. Malek also felt dissatisfied with their first meeting and wanted to have a chance to compare notes. Yes, Malek. I'll introduce Chiron to the council. We can now discuss our next move. Malek nodded respectfully and replied, I understand. I will relay your message to the rest. Thank you, Malek. I'll meet all of you at the conference hall, Stella said before disconnecting. Note please do consider supporting me on Buy Me a Coffee website and do like, share, and subscribe.